what took place and on a Monday show, we'll deal with uh, the impeachment trial, conclusion of the impeachment trial of Donald Trump. Uh, we'll talk about that Monday. So welcome to the African History Network show. It is Sunday, February 14th, 2021, and we are live. Hope everybody's doing well today. It is uh, Valentine's Day for many people, um, probably about 160 million people uh, in the U.S. celebrate Valentine's Day or so. And it's also a coma day. We'll talk about that. That's an African-centered alternative to Valentine's Day, a coma day. And this is also the assumed birth date of one Frederick Douglass. This is also the assumed birth date of Frederick Douglass, because Frederick Douglass was born a slave in Maryland, and he did not know the actual date of his birth or the actual year. He was knew he was born either 1817 or 1818. So this is also the assumed birth date. He took this birth date of February 14th. All right. So on today's show, uh, we're going to we have a jam packed show for you. We're going to deal with some of the history of Valentine's Day. Many people celebrate Valentine's Day. We were taught in school, you know, to buy the uh, Valentine's Day cards. Will you be my Valentine? You know, so when, when I was in school, we had we also had like the superhero Valentine's Day cards. You know, Superman and Batman, Wonder Woman, all that stuff. I don't know where that came from, but <laughs> we had those and you had the cartoon characters, uh, Valentine's Day cards, and you had the little heart candies. We would give out things like this. Right. And then, you know, it, it, Valentine's Day is named after St. Valentine. OK, but we didn't know who the hell St. Valentine was. This is just what the teachers told us to do and our parents told us to do. And then, you know, oftentimes we just do things that we're told to do, but we don't know why. OK, so we, 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 you know, we don't ask questions or if we ask questions, we ask questions to our teachers and parents and they don't know why either. They, that's because what their teachers and parents told them. OK, so <laughs> now I'm not a, I'm not attacking anybody who celebrates Valentine's Day. And after what we went through, you know, in 2020 with this fool who was in the White House, Donald Trump and coronavirus. And we had uh, uh, over 460,000 people die from coronavirus, things like this. I can understand people want to celebrate love. So I'm not beating up on, I'm really, I'm not beating up on anybody who celebrated Valentine's Day and you with the one you love or, or what have you. But it's important for us to understand the history of what it is that we are participating in. It's important for us to at least understand the history of what it is that we are participating in. And then that way it may uh, alter or change our level of participation or how we participate or whether we continue to participate in it in the first place. OK, oftentimes we're just doing things that we were told to do, but we don't know why. So we're going to deal with uh, some of the history of Valentine's Day. Do you know what you're celebrating? And I'm all for love and, you know, especially loving sisters. It ain't nothing like a sister. You know, I, 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 you've heard me say before, if I ain't black, I throw it back. I'm just that's just that's just the way it is. All right. So. <laughs> so we're going to talk about that. We'll also talk to them about a coma day. A coma day is a uh, African centered um, seven day celebration. That's an alternative to uh, Valentine's Day and uh, created by uh, Mancho and Nawasha um, uh, brothers, uh, uh, the, the, their the husband and wife. Uh, team, uh, Mon uh, Moncho and Nawasha, and I uh, contacted them, and I want to uh, interview them. I was trying to set up an interview uh, before Valentine's Day or before February 14th, but it's just been so busy, I haven't had time to do it. So uh, there was a broadcast that they did uh, today, and I shared it uh, on our Facebook fan page. They did it for a coma day. OK, I shared it. All right. So I want to say a special shout out to everybody watching. And uh, how you doing, Marnice? My niece is watching also. OK, so special shout out to my niece as well. All right. Um, then we're going to deal with the uh, history of Black History Month, African-American History Month and Dr. Carter G. Woodson. February 7th, 1926, Dr. Carter G. Woodson. Uh, introduced Negro History Week, the second week in February, okay? So we're going to deal with some of that history because, once again, every year, it never fails. 
people say why we have the shortest month of the year, why we have the coldest month of the year, why we need a Black History Month. You got one, uh, you know, you get this one idiot that's trying to run for governor. I'm not even going to say his name. Uh, and he's from Nigeria. We love our brothers and sisters from Nigeria, but you need to know what the hell you're talking about before you start talking. He said he's going to, if he's elected governor, which he's not going to be, uh, he's going to abolish uh, uh, Black History Month because it's racist and he is potentially, he, he, think, he thinks it's racist and uh, maybe illegal nonsense like this, right? Nobody talks about abolishing Jewish American History Month, which is May. Nobody talks about abolishing Native American History Month. And Native, and, and Native American Heritage Month. They have two um, uh, monthly cultural celebrations in, in uh, um, September and October, uh, uh, Native American History Month and, and uh, Native American Heritage Month. Uh, there's Irish American History Month, there's Jamaican American History Month. Um, different ethnic groups have their own monthly cultural celebration. When you study the history of them, and I have, all of them, most of them, if not all of them, came after 1976. 1976 is when Negro History Week became celebrated nationwide as a monthly cultural celebration, Black History Month. And President Gerald Ford did, a, did an address um, uh, recognizing Black History Month, okay, as a you know national celebration. So I, I, I find it interesting when you have these mouth poppers that just jump out here and put stuff out here and just spread these lies. So um, somebody really, when you got people like this, especially going to run for political office and appeal to white people and use African-Americans as a target to score political uh, points off of, they're going to use us as a political backboard, whether they're black, African, white, we have to light their asses up. That's just all there is to it. You, 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 you can't allow people to use you as a political backboard to score points off of, especially running on a campaign of trying to take something away from you and delegitimize your history. You got to light their asses up. That's all it is to it. So we'll talk some about that. Black, Black History Month origins, which is now African American History Month, for those that don't know. And we'll talk about the, uh, a little bit about the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, co-founded by Dr. Carter G. Woodson, September 9th, 1915, in Chicago, because that's the governing body of the African American History Month. Now, this year's annual theme for African American History Month is the Black Family, Representation, Identity, and Diversity. The Black Family, Representation, Identity, and Diversity. So each year you hear me talk about the annual theme. Unfortunately, when I do my African American History Month uh, presentations, I'll be doing one Tuesday. And then I'm also speaking February 24th for my sisters, the Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated. Sister Marnice Chris Jackson uh, invited me to speak. So I'll be on a panel discussion and uh, we'll give you some information about that. We'll put that on our website also, um, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Uh, and that's um, free. I think they're accepting donations, so you can definitely support. And uh, I'll be on a panel discussion for uh, African American History Month. This is taking place February 24th, and it is um, 7 p.m. Uh, to like 8.30 p.m. And um, it's going to be good. I'm telling, you, I'm telling you right now, it's going to be good. It's not going to be good because I'm on the panel. It's just gonna be good because it's gonna be good. But yeah, I'm on the panel also, so you know, you know, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna bring it. And then uh, I think we'll talk a little bit about the origins of uh, "Lift Every Voice and Sing," the Black National Anthem, which was written by uh, one of my frat brothers, uh, James Weldon Johnson, in 1899. I ain't know him personally, okay? Because <laughs> you know. <laughs> I wasn't born in 71, but he wrote Lift Every Voice and Sing, which became the Black National Anthem. All right. So uh, we'll talk some about the history of African-American History Month. And every year you hear people say things. Uh, why, we, why we had the shortest month of the year. You know, when's White History Month? White people have monthly cultural celebrations also. It's not just, see, now Tim Wise, Tim Wise, uh, the anti-racist uh, lecturer, Tim Wise says, White History Month is every other month that is 
not Black History Month or every other month or something like that, other level month. But you know, white people have monthly cultural celebrations also. Irish American History Month, Polish American History Month. The problem is people don't do research before they make these idiotic statements. That's the problem. They don't do research before they make these idiotic statements. Then Dave Chappelle on February 12th dropped an Instagram video, Wednesday, February 12th, and announced that uh, he's back on Netflix and Netflix has paid him millions of dollars. Now, you remember we talked about this a couple months ago where uh, Dave Chappelle was asking his fans not to watch Chappelle's show on Netflix streaming because of the uh, deal he did with Comedy Central. And when he did the deal with Comedy Central back in the early 2000s, streaming on Netflix didn't exist. OK, so that so so the streaming uh, aspect revenue aspect didn't exist back when he signed the deal and he said hey they're making money off of my show and i'm not getting paid for it all right well uh they've fixed that and we'll talk about that uh tmz has an article about that cbs.com uh, also um uh atlanta blackstar.com uh Dave chappelle talks about how uh you made my show you know he he was speaking of his fans uh, you made the show worthless. You you uh, didn't watch the show as I asked you to. And uh, now Netflix has paid me millions of dollars. OK, so we'll talk some about that as well. All right. Uh, my online course, people are still registering for it. You can still register for it. Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade what they didn't teach you in school this is a eight week 16 hour online course that i teach we kicked it off here in african american history month this is the first time i've taught this class since 2019 we already have uh you know we already have a lot of people registered for it we deal with thousands of years of history and we deal with what led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place okay so uh, we deal with ancient uh, ancient Egypt, ancient Kemet. We deal with the Nile Valley region of Africa. Uh, we deal with the 800 year occupation occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors. And when we deal with the transatlantic slave trade, you can't start our history in uh, slavery. You can't start uh, in the 15th century. You can't start in 1441 with the Portuguese bringing uh, the Portuguese going into uh, Mauritania. Uh, you can't start in 1619 in Jamestown, Virginia, even when we deal with the history of African people in this land that we call the United States of America. African people were in this land going back at least 51,700 years ago. All right. And this is something that Dr. David M. Hotel deals with in the book. The first Americans were Africans documented evidence. And this is one of the books I use in the class. Um, and I talked to Dr. David M. Hotep yesterday. Everybody's been asking me, when is this new book coming out? When is this new book coming out? Because, you know, we had him on our show October 12th, 2020, when we kicked off the show Monday through Friday. His new book is coming out. He said it'll be out uh, by the end of March 2021. Uh, they're just working on his index and uh, his end notes and bibliography. And um, he's going to be my guest in my class February 23rd, Tuesday, February 23rd. He'll be speaking to my online class. Uh, Tuesday, February 16th, our guest is going to be Sister Nubia Wartford, who's a cultural anthropologist and does archaeological digs in the Sudan. And we're going to talk about the uh, African women, uh, the Nubian women of antiquity, the Nubian women of antiquity. OK, we're going to uh, so you can register for the class at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. It's on sale, eighty dollars. All the classes are archived. Uh, you can go back and watch them over and over again if you missed the live class. We're going to post a link here. We'll talk about this on the other side of the break. You listen to the African History Network show right here on 910A on the Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. For 25 years, the Black History 101 Mobile Museum has carried on the rich legacy of the Black Museum movement in America by showcasing original artifacts of the Black experience at colleges, universities, K-12 schools, corporations, libraries, conferences, and cultural events, making it the most traversed Black History mobile exhibit in American history. Dr. Khalid El Hakim is the founder of the Black History 101 Mobile Museum, and he is a highly sought after public speaker on topics of black history, social studies, 
education, museum studies, hip hop, and race relations. Dr. Khalid was named among the change makers for NBC Universal's Erase the Hate campaign and listed as one of the 100 men of distinction for black enterprise. He recently founded the Michigan Hip Hop Archive on the campus of Western Michigan University. The Black History One on One Mobile Museum is currently scheduling in person and virtual exhibits nationwide. For more information, please contact Dr. Khalid Al Hakim directly at 313 645 4197, 313 645 4197, or visit their website at blackhistorymobilemuseum.com. That's blackhistorymobilemuseum.com. You can also email him at bhistory101 at yahoo.com, bhistory101 at yahoo.com. Are you getting ready for fall or winter? We have the solution for all seasonal clothing needs. Cometicwear.com is the go-to online source for Cometic African fashion and lifestyle products with a contemporary twist. We're committed to offering unique styles reflecting our African heritage. Cometicwear.com is inspired by Cometicscribes.com to influence our people in learning and showing pride. Please visit our website at Cometicwear.com. Visit 4glossygirls.com, that's the number 4glossygirls.com, and follow them on Instagram at 4glossygirls. Black Bees products are a collection of natural, organic, personal care products with an appreciation of nature and bees. Our philosophy is without bees, we have nothing. We are honoring our Nile Valley ancestors who understood the importance of bees. Black Bees created a high quality, natural, organic, personal care line that would be affordable to everyone. Hope you try and enjoy our Black Bees products line and come back and visit us at blackbeesproducts.com. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM Superstation of Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Sunday, February 14th, 2021, and we are live. Hope everybody's doing well. Call in numbers 313 778 7600 is the call in number if you have a question or comment. 313 313- 778-7600 is the call-in number if you have a question or comment. Uh, right before the break, I was telling you, so I'll, I'll be on this panel discussion for Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated, February 24, 2021, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 7 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. Let's celebrate Black history. Uh, we'll post this on our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. It's, it's a virtual uh, panel discussion. It's on Zoom. They have a whole uh, presentation uh, laid out, uh, whole presentation planned. So uh, we'll post this on our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, and you can register there for it, okay? That'll be February 24th, 2021. Uh, that's a Wednesday, 7 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. All right. Uh, okay, so we're going to jump into this here, dealing with the history of Valentine's Day. Now, on the African History Network show, we focus on educating and empowering and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Uh, because right now it's correct your own behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself, 
what you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. So when you control the radius of a man's thoughts or a woman's thoughts, you can control the circumference of his or her actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. Now, we deal with a number of different topics here on the African History Network show. We deal with current events and history, politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Sign up for And that's a good topic to talk about uh, on Valentine's Day is sex. Um, you're welcome, our niece. Uh, <laughs> um, that's a good topic to talk about is, um, yeah, anyway, let's move on. Okay. So <laughs> on Valentine's day or a coma day and a coma day is seven days. So that's, uh, even better. But anyway, um, because right now it's correct, wrong behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. Okay, so uh, also if you like this type of information, you can support the African History Network. Um, Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App. Then also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me, M-E forward slash the AHN show. And at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, click on the yellow donate button. Right there, that helps us keep broadcasting six days a week, stay on the air, etc. All right, okay, so let's jump into some of this history here. Then with Valentine's Day, now I encourage people, I encourage people to read the book African People and European Holidays and Mental Genocide by Dr. Ishaka Musa Barashango. African People and European Holidays A Mental Genocide by Dr. Ishaka Musa Barashango. Once again. I'm not attacking anyone that celebrates Christmas, Easter, Thanksgiving, uh, Valentine's Day, any of these other European based holidays we've been taught to celebrate. OK, and as, as I've said before, many times we're all going through a 12 step process, recovering from the side effects of white supremacy and racism. We're all going through a 12 step process, recovering from the side effects of white supremacy and racism. Each one of us are at different points in that recovery process. Some people are on level 10, step 10. Some people are on step two. Some people are on minus five. Okay. <laughs> we're all going through this process, trying to unlearn these things that we were taught. All right. So I'm not saying don't celebrate Valentine's Day, but if you do, if you're African-American and you do, you should at least know the history of what it is that you're celebrating. And that may have an impact on how you continue to celebrate it or if you continue to celebrate it. So let's look at some of this history here. First of all, who was Valentine? Okay. Who was Valentine? Who was St. Valentine? Because when we, you know, ask this question, it's just like uh, St. Patrick's Day. Who the hell was Pat who was Patrick? Oh, he was a saint. And there have been hundreds of saints. Okay. We'll talk about the origins of St. Patrick's Day, things like that around March 17th, because St. Patrick was a mass murderer. <laughs> who killed thousands of Druids in Ireland on behalf of the Christian church. And, and Ireland was a uh, uh, territory of the Roman Empire in 4th century AD. St. Patrick was a mass murderer. Okay, oftentimes you'll find, now this may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness. Maybe I should have said that before I started talking. This is, What I say may go outside the circumference of your own awareness. Just because you never heard it before, disagree with it or don't like it does not mean it's not true. It just means you should you should have to do some more research to understand what I'm talking about. OK, Patrick was a mass murderer. And if you want to do more research on that, read pages 193 and 194 of Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization by Tony Browder. This is one of the books I use in our online course. Also, uh, Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization by Tony Browder. Uh, and then also read this book here that deals with Irish history. So when I was doing uh, my presentations dealing with the history of St. Patrick's Day, I had to study Irish history, get a better understanding of Irish history. The Everything Irish History Heritage Book by Amy Hackney Blackwell and Ryan Hackney. OK, so this gives a good under good basic understanding of uh, some Irish history and put things in chronological order. So when we deal with. Uh, St. Valentine on February 14th, around the year 270 AD, around the year 270 AD, Valentine, who was a holy priest in Rome in the days of Emperor Claudius II, was executed. He was beheaded. Now, under the rule of Claudius the Cruel, as he was known, Claudius II, Claudius the Cruel, Rome was involved in many 
unpopular and bloody campaigns. You got to study this Roman history and it's, it's going to be the Romans that, you know, uh, fight in the Punic Wars against uh, the Carthaginians and Hannibal Barca, like the, the Battle of Cannae 216 BC that we've talked about here on this show before as well. Now, the emperor um, had to maintain a strong army. Emperor Claudius, the cruel Claudius II, had to maintain a strong army, but was having a difficult time getting soldiers to join his military leads. Now, Claudius, uh, Emperor Claudius II, believed that uh, Roman men were unwilling to join the army because of their strong attachment to their wives and their families, because of a strong attachment to their wives and their families. So to get rid of the problem, Emperor's uh, Emperor uh, Claudius the Cruel or Claudius II banned all marriages and engagements in Rome. So the uh, priest uh, Valentine, uh, when Valentine's act, so the priest Valentine, when his actions were discovered, Claudius ordered that he be put to death, okay? Uh, to get rid of the problem, uh, let me back up, to get rid of the problem, Claudius banned all marriages and engagements in Rome. The holy priest Valentine, realizing the injustice of the decree from Emperor, Emperor Claudius II, defied Claudius and continued to perform marriages for young lovers in secret. When uh, Valentine's uh, actions were discovered by Emperor Claudius II, Claudius ordered that Valentine be put to death. Priest uh, Valentine the priest was arrested and dragged before the uh, perfect of Rome who condemned him to be beaten to death with clubs and to have his head cut off. He was beheaded. The sentence was carried out on February 14th on or about the year uh, 270 AD. Okay, so right around 270 AD, February 14th. All right. Now, legend also has it that while in jail, St. Val Valentine, who became canonized as a saint later, all right. Valentine left a farewell note for the jailer's daughter who had become his friend and signed it from your Valentine. Now, at this point in time, it is important to note that we'll go to the phone lines in just a minute. 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is the call in number if you have a question or comment. It's important to note at this point in time in third century, third century A.D., Contrary to popular belief, the Catholic Church does not exist at this point in time. The Catholic Church does not come into existence until about mid 11th century AD, which is about 1050 or so, 1050 uh, AD, 1052, 1056, right around there. The Catholic Church comes into existence. At this point in time, in third century AD, you have the Eastern Orthodox Christian Church. Catholic Church does not exist. The Catholic Church is going to come, is going to split, there's going to be a schism from the Eastern Orthodox Church. And this is before uh, 11th century AD, is before the Protestant Reformation led by uh, Martin Luther in 1517 AD, okay? Not Martin Luther King, that's, that's gonna come hundreds of years later, but Martin Luther, okay? <laughs> All right, so let's continue here. So uh, for his great service, the priest Valentine was named a saint after his death. He was canonized as a saint after his death. Now, in truth, the exact origins and identity of St. Valentine are unclear. All right. Now, according to uh, the Catholic Encyclopedia, they state, quote, at least three different, at least three different St. Valentines, all of them martyrs, are mentioned in the uh, early uh, martyrologies, um, the um, the records of uh, martyrs, the martyrologies, uh, under the date of February 14th, okay? At least three different St. Valentines, all of the martyrs are mentioned in the early martyrologies under the date of February 14th. Now, one was a priest in Rome, the second was a bishop of uh, Interama, uh, now attorney in Italy, and the third St. Valentine was a martyr in the Roman province of Africa, as they put it here, Africa. Now, that at this point in time, 
they uh, are probably not referring to the entire continent of Africa. They're probably referring to uh, Carthage, where the Punic Wars were taking place. Carthage, because Publius Cornelius Scipio Africanus, and I just did a post about this. Brother Bomani uh, sent me a um, text message because you still have people putting this nonsense out here saying that uh, Africa was named after Publius Cornelius Scipio Africanus, and uh, he lived 236 BC to 183 BC. Um, and he, he's fighting against, uh, you know, he's he in the Punic Wars, you have a Rome fighting against Carthage. All right. Uh, in actuality, the word Africanus in Latin means uh, of Africa, of Africa, or it can mean belonging to Africa. If you read uh, Cassell's Latin English Dictionary, the 2002 edition, on page 11 in the entry for a fear, A-F-E-R, it tells you what Africanus means in Latin. Africanus means of Africa or it can mean belonging to Africa. And the fact of the matter is, is for Blaise Cornelius Scipio Africanus, his family's last name was not Africanus, it was Scipio. He takes the surname Africanus after he conquers this territory uh, where the Car Carthaginians are. And Africa is actually named after the Afri, A-F-R-I. The Afri are a group of black African people in Algeria and Tunisia. And Tunisia used to be called Carthage. So if you look at the, um, first of all, if you look at uh, African people in world history, by Dr. John Henry Clark, and that book is around here. That book is around here somewhere. I've got, uh, you know, I'm preparing for presentations this week and I, I'm preparing for an uh, online course. And I just saw that book. I don't know what the hell it is. But anyway, if you look at pages 14 and 15 of African People in World History by Dr. John Henry Clark, he talks about the Afrique, okay, and who they are. And uh, so, no. Africa is not named after Publius Cornelius Scipio Africanus. That's backwards. Also, if you look at the uh, uh, Columbia Encyclopedia, okay. And let me just let me just break this down. This is what this is what I posted uh, on my Facebook fan page, the African History Network, to break this down. Many people mistakenly are promoting that the continent of Africa is named after a Roman general named Publius Cornelius Scipio Africanus, who lived 236 BC to 183 BC and was involved in the Second Punic War. Apparently, they haven't referenced a Latin English dictionary because the name Africanus actually means of Africa. OK, in, in, in Africa was not named that Al-Kibalon Al -Kibal Al is Arabic. That Al, that Al prefix is Arabic as an Al-Andalus, which is what the Moors call the southern portion of Spain, where they settled in when they go in in 711 AD as an alcohol, as an algebra. Those are alcohol and algebra. Those are things that the Moors are introducing into Europe. That's Arabic. OK, now Al-Kibalan is, is an old name, but it ain't the, what Africa was originally called. No. Um, so apparently they haven't referenced the Latin English dictionary because the name Africanus actually means of Africa. It was called Africa before uh, Publius Cornelius Scipio uh, existed. North Africa was also at one point called Afri, Afri. The Afri were a group of black African people who lived in Algeria and Tunisia. Tunisia used to be called Carthage. Read pages 14 and 15 of African People in World History by Dr. John Henry Clark. He talks about the Afri there. Also look up uh, Scipio Africanus Major in the Columbia Encyclopedia, which is online, uh, encyclopedia.com, and search for uh, Columbia Encyclopedia and the entry for uh Scipio Africanus major it tells you that he took his surname Africanus after the area that he conquered after the area that he conquered which was um something that uh Roman uh conquerors did he had uh Publius Cornelius Scipio had a brother named Lucius Lucius takes the surname Asiaticus after he conquers part of Asia Nobody says Asia is named after uh, Lucius, Scipio, 
the, the, Lupius, uh, Lucius Scipio Afro, uh, Asiaticus, nobody says Asia's name after him. This just this is nonsense. Nowhere does it say that Africa, when you read the, the entry from the uh, Columbia Encyclopedia, nowhere does it say that Africa was named after Scipio Africanus, but just the opposite. The Columbia Encyclopedia entry for Africa on encyclopedia.com correctly states that, quote, he was named Africanus after the country he conquered, end quote. This stuff is just ass backwards. Now, the word Africanus in Latin means of Africa, which means that Africa preceded Scipio Africanus. So how so uh, so how could Africa be named after Publius Cornelius Scipio Africanus? This is another example of misinformation and myths that have been repeated because we don't do research. Read Cassell's Latin English Dictionary 2002 edition, page 11 in the entry for fear. Uh, and it gives you the definition of Africanus as Latin. Uh, this myth has led to much self-hatred in African people in America not wanting to identify with Africa because they mistakenly think it was named after a European, but they want to be called American, who we know was named after another European, partly, America Ves uh, Amerigo Vespucci. Now, Vespucci, when you read Fulcrums Are Changed by Jan Carew, um, and I was talking to one of my teachers, Professor Kaba Hayawatha Kamene, one day. Now, we were off, we're, we're not off the topic of Valentine's Day because all this history is connected. I'm going to come back to Valentine's Day in just a minute. But all this, all, all of this is connected. I was talking to Professor Kaba Hayawatha Kamene one day, and I was asking him, asking him about the origins of the word America. He referenced the book. Fulcrums of Change by Jan Carew. And Fulcrums of Change by Jan Carew, Jan Carew talks about the Los Amarisques. The Los Amarisques were a group of Black African people in what today is called Nicaragua. And they named them, uh, uh, they named their, they took their name after a, um, a mountain that was uh, nearby called, um, I forgot the name, I think it was called a, a, a Mary, okay? The, let me see, um, yeah, so, and what happens is, is Amerigo Vespucci is going to come in contact with these um, African, with, with these people in Nicaragua, these Africans in Nicaragua, and he's going to take the name uh, Amerigo, Okay, he's gonna he's gonna take the, the he's gonna take uh, his name from that name of those people. I'm gonna pull this information up. This is um, something that we talk about in the online course. So I'm gonna show this to you because you don't have to believe me. Proper documentation ends all conversation. You don't have to believe me. You can go research this yourself. And and what uh, Professor Kava did was he he faxed over to me the pages of the book. Um, Fulcrums of Change, where Jan Karu talks about this. So I, I read it, okay? L let me pull up this uh, screen share quickly, then we'll go to the phone lines, okay? Then we'll get back into this. Um, let me see. We got to pull this up right here. I want you to see this. So I, and if you go, if you listen, if you go into the archives of my interviews on Blog Talk Radio, uh, I interviewed... I interviewed um, Professor Kaba about this as well. We did an interview February 3rd, 2016. Professor Kaba Kamene, the origin of the word America. Okay, Fulcrums of Change, uh, the Los Amarisques. Uh, they they live near a mountain called Sierra Amarique. Sierra Amarique, A-M-E-R-R-I-Q-E, -E, Sierra Amarique. And they took their name uh, from that mountain, these black African people, in, in Nicaragua. They call themselves the Los Amarisques. And these are the people who uh, Ameri his name was Amerigo. Amerigo Vespucci comes in contact with. Uh, sorry. Let, me, let me back up. His name was Alberigo Vespucci, who changes his name to Amerigo. And Amerigo comes from the Los Amarisques. These these black African people in Nicaragua who um, take their name from the mountain called Sierra Amarique. 
okay? So Amerigo was not his original name, all right? When you research this, Amerigo was not his original name. Um, so it's similar to Publius Cornelius Scipio taking the surname Africanus after the territory that he's conquering. That's named after the Afri, all right? So when you go deeper into this, you start seeing, okay, it is, and, and also, like, for instance, when you look at uh, Christopher Columbus, his name was, uh, uh, well, that's a, a translation. It's not his real name. Christopher Colon would, would be one of the more proper names. Uh, Christopher Columbus is like an English translation of, uh, of his name. Uh, or Christo uh, Christopher uh, Colombo. Okay, but Christopher Columbus is like an English translation. All right. Okay, so check this out. And then if we take it one step further, if you go to the 1828 Noah Webster Dictionary, 1828 edition of Noah Webster Dictionary, and you look up the word American, okay, and look at the definition of what an American is, it tells you that an American is a native of America. It tells you that the word American originally applied to the aboriginals or copper colored races found here by the Europeans. Well, wait a second. If the term American originally applied to the aboriginals or copper colored races found in the Americas by Europeans, that means that Europeans were not the original Americans. Which then ties into Dr. David M. Hotep's book, the first Americans were Africans. Because who was here? In African people, the Khoisan were here before Native Americans even came to existence. I'm not trying to take anything away from Native American history. Okay, but let's 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 look at the timelines. All right. And one thing that Dr. David M. Hotel told me, and this bears this bears out to be true, is that he said you would never find remains of Native Americans other than Homo sapiens, which are modern man. You would never find remains of Native Americans other than Homo sapiens, which is modern man, because they didn't exist before then. With us, you'll find Australopithecus afarensis, uh, uh, Homo erectus. You'll find all, all, all those different going all the way back as far as you want to go. All those different uh, classifications of human species, all that, you'll find African people. Okay, uh, Lucy, Dinknesh, okay, Australopithecus afarensis, all that th about three and a half million years ago. Or, or as far as you want to go back, it's going to be African. Okay, but he said you won't find any other than modern man for Native Americans because Native Americans, who, who we call Native American, and I'm not trying to take anything away from Native American history. I have Cherokee and Blackfoot in my family, so I'm not trying to, but you know, my mother's from Tennessee, so. They're all down in Tennessee, and many of us have Native American ancestry. But in Africans were here in this land going back at least 51,700 years ago, and he dropped some new research on me when I talked to him yesterday, uh, pushing the date back. Uh, well, I, I don't want to say, uh, it, Even further beyond 100,000 years ago in South America. Let me leave it there because I'm not sure if it's peer reviewed or not. Um, but Asians come to this land around 3000 BC. The Africans who are already here and the Asians are going to intermix. Their offsprings are who we call Native Americans. You, you will never find remains of Native Americans older than Homo sapiens, uh, uh, other species other than Homo sapiens. Because they didn't exist before then. This is not trying to take anything away from their history. But you got to understand this chronology of history. Last 50,000, 100,000 years of history. You have to understand this chronology. Okay. So um, that being said. <laughs> all right. And then just, just so everybody knows. Um, if you let me post this link here again. We'll go to the phone lines uh, quickly here. 
If you want to register for the online course that I teach, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school, this is some of the type of information we deal with. And we're going to have Dr. David M. Hotep, Dr. David M. Hotep speak to uh, my class um, Tuesday, February 23rd, 8 p.m. Okay, so you can uh, register. It's uh, uh, eight session, 16 hour online course. All of us, we do it live. You can watch live. It's all recorded. And um, as soon as you watch, as soon as you register, you can watch class number one. Class number two, February 16th, 2021, my guess is going to be Sister Nubia Wartford, who's a cult cultural anthropologist. We're going to deal with the uh, Nubian women of antiquity. OK, and we get into some deep stuff as well. Um, somebody posted. So Eric Williams posted uh, David, Dr. David M. Hotel's book is nine hundred dollars on Amazon. That's book. That's the first book. The first book is out of print. The first book is out of print. Check with a local, check with your local African American book dealer, see if you get it. His second book is going to be $49.99, if I remember correctly. And uh it's going to have like about 200 uh, additional pages, more research. That will be out, he told me, uh, by the end of March 2021. Okay. Let's go quickly to the phone lines, uh, and then we'll get we'll jump back on the history of, of Valentine's Day. Okay, but all this history is connected. Let's go quickly to the phone lines. Let's go to uh mother z mother z line one thanks for holding mother z tell us where you're calling from mother z i'm calling from pontiac but listen you're calling from pontiac you know bloody dress, love. hold on hold on back hold on just so, slow down for a second slow down for a second you said you're calling from pontiac michigan yes okay we have people listening all across the country so i want them to know what pontiac michigan is okay go ahead mother z Sorry, Pontiac, Michigan, which is in the northern area, considered Oakland County. Yeah, blah, that's fine. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. Whatever. Yeah, go ahead with your question or comment. Okay, Michael, my love. I want to know, or I'm making a suggestion, why don't you record all that you're talking? Because most of the time you're talking so bloody fast, I, even my mind is catches up with you but i would love to it, this is being recorded mother mother z mother z this is being recorded we're broadcasting right now on my facebook fan page the african history network we're broadcasting on my youtube channel michael m hotel all these broadcasts that i do i have 10 years over a thousand shows archived we're on nine different audio podcast platforms so say hi to everybody watching right now they, they can they can hear you loud and clear all this stuff is archived if you go to my face if you go to my the other thing the other thing that I have to ask you to do is to look up a young gentleman who was my great uncle, mm -hmm. Dr. Francis Owu, O W O O H, who was a professor of anthropology at Columbia University in the 1670s, and he died. Look him up because it'd be great information for you. And my love, I I say I do not do Valentine. Because it's a pagan holiday, and I'm Ghanaian. <laughs> right. But anyway, okay. Sp spell his last name again. Spell his. Spell it. I give you all my blessings. Spell, spell his last name again, or your uh, or your uncle. I'm trying to write it down. What's his last name? O W O O H. But they pronounce it Owen, but it's Owu. Okay. From Ghana, West Africa. From Ghana, West Africa. What was his first name? Okay, Francis. Okay, and he was a, he was a, a college professor. He was a doctor of anthropology at Columbia University, right there in New York City. Okay, anthropology at uh, Columbia University. Okay, all right, I'll look it up. Okay, okay, Mother Z. Yeah, okay, and it, and if you go to if you go to my website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, right on the home page, click on Listen to Podcasts. You can listen to audio podcasts of the shows, and it has the link to uh, our Facebook page and YouTube where all this stuff is archived there. All these shows. Oh, I do, I do appreciate it, love. And I'll talk to you very soon. Thank you so much. Have a blessed day. All right, Mother Z. Thanks for calling. All right. Okay. So we got Eric in Cleveland uh, on watching us on, uh, what is he, on Facebook. Eric in Cleveland, Facebook. Uh, we got Shalanda on Facebook also. Let's go back to the phone lines quickly here. Let's go to 
uh, Sturge, Sturge, line two. Welcome to the African History Network show. Thanks for calling. Tell us where you're calling from, Sturge. We lost Sturge. Okay, we lost Sturge. Okay, let's go. We have Marathon, line three. Hey, how you doing, man? Hey, Marathon, how you doing, man? Thanks for holding. Tell everybody where you're calling from. I'm calling from Studio A of Tune Productions in Detroit. Okay, in Detroit. And I made out like I made out like a bandit for Valentine's Day, and I'm I'm gonna share this with you. Okay. I just spent up but ten dollars, man. Ten dollars? You spent ten dollars? Yeah, I went to Family Dollars. Okay. I went to the, um, the where you get the glass jars with the lock lids. Right. And then I went to the uh, the arts department, the arts line, and got the googly eyes. Mm-hmm. Put the googly eyes on the jar, used acrylic paint, and wrote childlike. What's your lady's name? Go, go ahead. What'd you say now? What's your lady's name? Well, I'm not in a relationship right now, but just go okay, ahead. Go so ahead with your story. Her name is Susie. Okay. Then I, I write Susie sweet stuff. Mm-hmm. Then I, I fill it up with dollar candy bars. Then I make out like a bandit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, man. And I'm making love tonight, buddy. Woo. Okay. We won't hold you up, Marathon. Thanks for calling. Let's go to, uh, let's go to, let me see. Uh, we got time to uh, start with Dave on uh, line four before we go to commercial break, Jalen. Okay, let's go. Let's get Dave. Hey, Dave uh, from West Virginia. Uh, welcome to the African History Network show. How you doing? I'm doing fine, Michael. How are you? Oh, I'm all right, man. I'm all right. Go ahead. We're coming up on a break. We'll hold you over, but go ahead and start your uh, with your question or comment. Yeah, this uh, the uh, American Indian um, thing. Uh, I'm wondering, are we using the term "we" a little widely? A little broadly, I think the African ancestry has said that they're, when they test blacks, uh, they only come in about one or two percent with any any Indian heritage at all. So, are we using the term "we" a little uh, broadly well, on when we well, say that well, when, when, here? When, when when European settlers get got here, you had uh, groups of Africans that got reclassified as Native Americans, also. We had groups of African mouth. There was a reclassification that went on in the state of Virginia in the 1900s, but that wasn't every. There wasn't everybody. That was just in one particular state, right? Say that again now. Yeah, there was there was a the reclassification that went on and uh, went on in the state of Virginia by a guy named Tucker. Mm-hmm. But that wasn't every. Yeah, that was just in the state of Virginia. That wasn't. That was well, a national uh, program. Well, you, 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 you're gonna you're gonna have that uh, happening a lot. That's 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 one of the ways our populations got uh, uh, absorbed. That's one of the ways our population got absorbed. Then the other thing that's gonna happen is that, for instance, on the Trail of Tears in the uh, 1830s, uh, when the Choctaw, mm-hmm. Chickasaw, Creek, Cherokee, and Seminole Indians get pushed off their land in southeast United States. And they uh, right. get forced over a thousand miles to walk on the uh, go out west on the Trail of Tears. One third of the people right. with one third of the people with them were Africans because they yeah, because they because Africans, be, 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 because because they own slave. Well, you're going to have them intermix, interbreed into those populations. Okay. All right. Thanks for calling, man. Keep keep listening. All right, we're coming up here on commercial break. Listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. With BlackBusinessTea.com, the messages are clear and meaningful. Keep your business in the black and out of the red. Mind your black business. Know your numbers and plan strategically. Black business boss, lead your industry. Support black business encourage patronize and uplift one another blackbusinesstea.com currently has products sold in detroit atlanta chicago and los angeles with proceeds returned to the black community they have a wide selection of hoodies t-shirts mugs hats sweatshirts that support black owned businesses Visit the website blackbusinesstea.com. That's blackbusinesstea.com. 
Do you have an idea or business that requires app development or thinking of moving your IT resources to the cloud? We have post-paid and profit-sharing plans for unique ideas or profitable businesses. Who can take advantage of this unique program? Entrepreneurs with unique ideas, startups, small to medium businesses. Contact us, 267-209-0352. Visit nomadicsystems.net, nomadicsystems.net today. Intuitive Design Clothing is an online accessory store that sells one-of-a-kind signature statement pieces for men and women. They also specialize in fashion consultations, closet organization, and decorating small spaces. Are you looking for a statement piece for a special affair or would you like to add some select pieces to your ensemble of accessories? If you're looking for something different, definitely contact Kathy Norman, owner and CEO of Intuitive Design Clothing. Visit their website, intuitivedesignclothing.com. That's intuitivedesignclothing.com and you can email her at info at intuitivedesignclothing.com. Intuitive Design Clothing is where every entrance is a grand entrance. Soul Natural Beauty Products offers organic, plant-based skin and hair care products that will rejuvenate skin and naturally grow and thicken hair. Their whipped shea butter can heal or restore damaged skin cells to prevent hyperpigmentation and skin breakouts. All products are made with organic plant-based ingredients. Their maximum hair growth oil is fortified with organic herbal extracts and undeniably proves that Mother Nature knows best. It thickens, lengthens, softens, and conditions all types of hair. They even guarantee hair improvement within 90 days or a full refund. Their all-natural 24-hour deodorant leaves the body smelling fresh without sweating for up to 24 hours. It does not stain fabric, goes on smoothly, and has a refreshing lavender and frankincense aroma. It can be used by men and even children. Place your order today at SoulNaturalBeautyProducts.com. That's SoulNaturalBeautyProducts.com. And follow them on Facebook at Soul Natural Beauty Products. Okay, so I'm going to post this article here. I, I talked about it last week. I talked about this article last week. This is from um, Smithsonian Magazine. SmithsonianMag.com, which is the official website of Smithsonian Institute. Smithsonian Magazine. How Native American slaveholders complicate the Trail of Tears narrative. How Native American slaveholders complicate the Trail of Tears na narrative. The new exhibition, Americans at the National Museum of the American Indian, prompts a deeper dive for historic truths. This is from March 6, 2018. What's gonna happen is about a third of the people on the Trail of Tears were African people, okay? Now, they're going to, but, but they also intermix into the Native American population. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation of Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Sunday, February 14th, 2021. And we are live. Calling numbers 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is the call-in number if you have a question or comment. Uh, I was referencing during the break to people watching around the country on Facebook and YouTube, I was referencing this article that I talked about early in the week from smithsonianmag.com official website of the smithsonian institute smithsonianmag.com name, name of this article is how native american slaveholders complicate the trail of tears narrative how native american slaveholders complicate the trail of tears narrative the new exhibition americans new exhibition called americans at the national museum of the american indian prompts a deeper dive for historic truths now, this is an article written by Ryan P. Smith, March 6, 2018, for smithsonianmag.com. 
And it talks about the fact that the Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, Cherokee, and Seminole Indians all owned African slaves. Okay. A third of the a third of the people on the Trail of Tears were Africans. They owned African slaves. You had Africans who were part of these Native American nations, but they're going to intermix into those populations. They're going to have sex with who we call Native Americans, but Native Americans are the offspring of an intermixing of Africans and Asians. That's why you got to read Dr. David M. Hotep's book. He has 713 footnotes, seven peer-reviewed articles backing up this information. So, so you really have to understand who you're talking about when you talk about Native Americans. You have to understand who you're talking about. But very quickly here, if you if you if we look at this quickly, then we got to get back to the information dealing with Valentine's Day. If you read this article, what you probably don't picture are Cherokee slaveholders, foremost among them. Cherokee Chief John Ross, Ross, R-O-S-S. -S. What you probably don't picture are the numerous African-American slaves Cherokee owned who made the brutal march themselves on the Trail of Tears or, or else were shipped in mass to what is now Oklahoma aboard cramped boats by their wealthy Indian masters. Because, see, once again, this, this ties into, so you're talking about Oklahoma. This ties into the history of Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma. OK, why is that? Because Tulsa was founded by Creek Indians around 1836, who got about 1834, 1836, who went on the Trail of Tears into Oklahoma and they took their African slaves with them. So when you talk about the history of Black Wall Street and in, in, in North Tulsa and the Greenwood, Archer and Pine uh, business district, business district, then you look at the fact that many of the early african americans uh uh many of the er early african american landowners in tulsa got land from the uh black freedmen indian treaties of 1866 because they had uh creek indian ancestry one of them and then you had sarah rector who we talked about a couple of weeks ago sarah rector who uh was the richest afro american girl in america uh, in about right about 1913, she was a millionaire, and she got land from that Black Fre Black Freedmen Indian Treaties, and then also the Dawes Allotment Act of 1887, and the Dawes Allotment Act redistributed. It, initially, it was supposed to redistribute 138 million um, uh, square acres of land, something like 138 million square acre, square acres of land um, among Native Americans and uh, like black Indians. Okay. But white people ended up getting two thirds of that land also, you know, but we did get some land. That's, this is how you get a Sarah Rector. The history is there. All you have to do is follow the chronology of history. So when we look at the article from, uh, face to face Africa.com, we talked about this last week. Okay. And, uh, I'm going to try to pull this up quickly so we can get back to, uh, Valentine's day. But when we look at this article from face to face Africa.com, and we share a lot of articles from face to face Africa.com, also blackpass.org has a good article dealing with Sarah Rector. Okay, this ties into Creek Indian history. This ties into also Oklahoma, Black Wall Street, all of this. Um, let me see. Hold on, let me pull up this article here. Yeah, 12 years old, Sarah Rector became America's youngest black millionaire in 1913. And they called her Afro-American because the term Afro-American wasn't created in the 1960s. The term Afro-American goes back to the 1830s. Okay. And then, you know, while well, we're talking about it, not to make this too complicated, the term African-American wasn't created by Jesse Jackson in 1989 or 1980, 1988 to 89. The term African-American goes back to 1782 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. These are very old terms. This ain't nothing new. Not, not only that, um, March 29th, 1964, when Malcolm delivers his speech, The Ballad of the Bullet in Washington Heights, New York, Malcolm uses the term African-Americans in that speech. That's 64. Are we going to say Jesse Jackson told Malcolm X to, to say African-Americans? Come on. Come on. Read this article here from uh, face to face Africa.com. Meet Sarah Rector, the 12-year-old. This tw Meet Sarah Rector. The 12 year old who became America's youngest black millionaire in 1913. Sarah Rector 
was of uh, 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 Black Creek Indian ancestry. Okay, Sarah Rector was born in Indian Territory, March third, nineteen o two. She was considered "quote unquote" colored, though not African American. She was African American, but they didn't consider her that. They considered her colored. Her parents were owned by Creek Indians before the Civil War. As the site U.S. Slave explains, she, as the site U.S. Slave explains, she and some 600 other black children were entitled to land allotments as the children of enslaved people belonging to the Creek Indian Nation. Why? In 1866, the Creek Indian Nation signed a treaty with the United States government promising to emancipate their 16,000 slaves and incorporate them into their nation, the Creek Indian Nation, as citizens entitled to, quote, equal interest in the soil and national funds, end quote. Two decades later, the federally imposed Dawes Allotment Act of 1887 sparked the beginning of the quote unquote total assimilation of the Indians of the so called five civilized tribes by forcing them to live on individually owned allotments of land instead of communally as they had done for centuries. End quote. All this history is, is tied together. And her uh, parents were um, owned by uh, the Creek Indians. Okay. And you're going to have intermixing. It's just like it's just like with the Moors in, in Europe. OK, why why do you think the what why do you think the why do you think the Spanish and, and, and the Portuguese were of a darker complexion than the Australians? Oh, sorry, not Australians, Austrians, Austrians and the Germans and the English. Because Spain and Portugal is right above Morocco. And the Moors are going up into uh, Spain and Portugal and they're changing the complexion of Europeans, but Spain and Portugal gets like the brunt of it because they're closer in proximity to Africa than Austria and Germany and England. Now, you're going to have that, you're going to have that intermixing taking place there as well. It's just to a lesser extent because this is how you get Queen Charlotte Sophia, who was the wife of King George III. Queen Charlotte Sophia was of African Moorish ancestry on her mother's side of the family. And and the 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 um the series that's on Netflix I forgot the name of it with the Queen it's portrayed they're dealing with Queen Charlotte Sophia I don't know how historically accurate all of it is I haven't seen it okay I'm so I'm so busy with what I'm doing but there was an article from CBS.com we're gonna get back to Valentine's Day in just a minute here okay <laughs> all this is history okay uh, I, I posted an article on my personal page I don't think I posted on my uh, uh, the African History Network page yet, but is dealing with um, Queen Charlotte Sophia, okay? And let me see, is this the right one? Uh, it's the, let me see, it's, um, it's dealing with the, I have to, I have to find it. Um, it's dealing with the, the, the series that's on, um, Netflix is dealing with that series. And let me see here. Try to uh, pull this up. Uh, Queen Charlotte of uh, Me Mecklenburg uh, Strelitz. But she was the wife of King George III. King George III was the king who the 13 colonies are revolting against. OK, during the American Revolutionary War. And let me see if we could pull this up. Uh, OK. There was a there was a video they had. OK. Um, and, and the video's not coming up. They must have taken it down or something. I don't know. But. She she's the. Uh, like the inspiration behind the, uh, the the series on Netflix, okay? CBS had a video about it. I have to try to locate it. All right. Uh, somebody post the name of that uh, uh, 
series here. And why they why they took this down? Maybe it's at their website, cbsnews.com uh, or cbs.com. But anyway, all of this is connected. All right. Okay. So, uh, research Sarah Rector. Watch the. I did a show last week. We talked about Sarah Rector also. All right. Um, once again, the online course that I teach, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Maafa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. We get deep into history like this. So you can register for it. We'll post a link here. You can register for it, uh, and it's a sixteen-hour, uh, eight-week online course. You do it on Tuesdays, eight p.m. to eleven p.m. Eastern Standard Time, eight p.m. to uh, 8, PM, eight p.m. to ten p.m. Eastern Standard Time, eight p.m. to ten p.m. Eastern Standard Time, because I got to be here eleven p.m. on Tuesday. Um, you can register there. It's uh, eighty dollars, regular hundred thirty dollars. All the sessions are archived. We do it live, but all the sessions are archived. Okay. Uh, is it called the Crown? It, it's uh, yeah, Bridget, uh, Bridgerton, yeah, Bridgerton on uh, Netflix. That's the name of it. You may be able to find this uh, clip here on YouTube. Um, okay, and it's just the right one from CBS News. Uh, it's called the history behind. Uh, Colonia. It's called it's called the history behind uh, the series, the history behind a series on Netflix or something. And it's talking about Queen Charlotte Sophia. All right. I'll try to find it on. Uh, I'll try to find it on YouTube. OK, let's continue here. Uh, I, I want to get back to the uh, history of uh, Valentine's Day. All right. But the online course, you can also register at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Okay, so we talked about St. Valentine. We'll go back to the phone lines in just a minute here because time is getting away from us. We talked about St. Valentine. Um, so in truth, the exact origins and identity of St. Valentine are unclear. According to the Catholic Encycl according to the Catholic Encyclopedia, quote, at least three different St. Valentines all of them martyrs are mentioned in the early uh, martyrologies um, under the date of February 14th. One was a priest in Rome. The second one was a bishop of uh, Interama, now Terni in Italy. And the third, St. Valentine, was a martyr in the Roman province of Africa. Now, legends vary on how the martyr's name became connected with romance. The date of his death, uh, February 14th, about 270 AD, may become mingled with the feast of Lupercalia. Lupercalia was a, quote unquote, pagan festival of love, pagan festival of love. So when you deal with Valentine's Day, just like when you did, now this may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness, just because you never heard about it, disagree with it or don't like it does not mean it's not true. Just like Valentine's Day, just like Christmas deals with pre-Christian origins and it deals with uh, what are called pagan festivals intermixed with um, Christian origins and things like this. You see the same thing with Valentine's Day. OK. And you see like the Roman festival of Saturnalia. OK. Which was which is uh, which, which was a precursor to Christmas. You see the Roman festival of Lupercalia which is a precursor to Valentine's Day. So with the Feast of Lupercalia, a pagan festival of love, on these occasions, the naming of young women were placed in a box from which uh, they were drawn by the men as, uh, as chance directed. Now, in 496 AD, Pope uh, Galatius decided to put an end to the Feast of Lupercalia, and he declared that February 14th be celebrated as St. Valentine's Day, St. Valentine's Day. This is 5th century A.D., 496. Pope Galatius um, declared that February 14th be celebrated as St. Valentine's Day. That gradually, February 14th became a date for exchanging love messages, poems, and simple gifts such as flowers. OK, so read this from um, History.com, official website of the History Channel. 
This deals with this day in history, February 14th, St. Valentine beheaded. This day in history, February 14th, St. Valentine beheaded. I get the emails dealing with this day in history every morning. They come in about 6 a.m. from uh, history.com, official website of the History Channel. Okay, we'll talk some more about that. What I want to do, uh, what we're going to do, Jalen, let's go to let's go to the clip from uh, uh, history.com. That was clip one. This is a brief synopsis of the origins of Valentine's Day. Uh, let's go to this clip here. For all its popularity, history doesn't give us any guarantees as to the origins of Valentine's Day. But we do know it contains vestiges of the early Christian church in ancient Rome. The association between mid-February and romance goes back to a pagan festival known as Lupercalia, likely honoring either Lupa, the she-wolf of Rome, who suckled Romulus and Remus, or Faunus, their god of fertility. The festivities began with an animal sacrifice. Then the ritualistic slapping of young women with strips of the animal's skin and blood to bestow fertility for the coming year. In the 5th century, perhaps in an effort to Christianize the pagan festival, Pope Gelasius declared February 14th as St. Valentine's Day. As for the real St. Valentine, there were reportedly several canonized by the church. Legend has it that one St. Valentine, a defiant Roman priest, lived during the 3rd century AD under Emperor Claudius II. Claudius was an ambitious ruler. His battles required vast armies of men to abandon their young families for long periods of time, resulting in a military that was half-hearted and homesick. So determined was Claudius to stop love from sapping the will of his armies, he banned marriages altogether. Father Valentine thought the ban unjust and defied the emperor, continuing to marry young lovers in secret. The emperor eventually caught on to the priest's actions, arrested him, and sentenced him to death. It is believed that young couples he had secretly wed would visit his cell, passing him flowers and notes through the bars as symbols of their gratitude. The story continues that the condemned Father Valentine fell in love with his jailer's daughter. On February 14th, the day he was executed, it is said he passed the young girl a note. It was signed, From Your Valentine. A tradition was born. Cupid, the winged matchmaker, started out as the Roman god of love, inspired the image of cherubs for Christians, and is now a favorite of card makers and mass marketers. Our modern Valentine's Day, removed from its religious and pagan past, has evolved into one of the most celebrated holidays on the calendar. On average, Americans shower their loved ones with 180 million roses, red ones naturally, and almost 36 million heart-shaped boxes of candy, not to mention all those cards, dinners, and diamonds. All told, the holiday brings in almost $14 billion annually, giving retailers plenty to love as well. But if you're worried that you can't afford to treat your loved one properly next Valentine's Day, take heart. The poets were right. Love is really all you need. Come on, man. Okay, pause it right there, uh, Jalen. Thank you. All right, so that's that's from History.com, um, and that deals with uh, Valentine's Day, history of Valentine's Day. They have that on YouTube, and they have documentaries dealing with the history of these different holidays, uh, et cetera. If you, I wrote an article back in 2016. Now, when you go to my website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, uh, right on the homepage, click on uh, Read Articles by Michael M. Hotel because I read articles also. Haven't written, haven't written any of them in at least a year. Um, hey, it's just been so busy. We'll get back to that, but that's a whole nother conversation. Um, we have this. I have this article that I wrote back in 2016. Why do African Americans celebrate Valentine's Day? Do we really know what we're celebrating? And I deal with some of this history there. We're coming up on a break. We'll continue this on the other side of the break. This is the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation of Future Radio. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. 
For 25 years, the Black History 101 Mobile Museum has carried on the rich legacy of the Black Museum movement in America by showcasing original artifacts of the Black experience at colleges, universities, K-12 schools, corporations, libraries, conferences, and cultural events, making it the most traversed Black History mobile exhibit in American history. Dr. Khalid El Hakim is the founder of the Black History One on One Mobile Museum, and he is a highly sought after public speaker on topics of black history, social studies, education, museum studies, hip hop, and race relations. Dr. Khalid was named among the change makers for NBC Universal's Erase the Hate campaign and listed as one of the 100 men of distinction for black enterprise. He recently founded the Michigan Hip Hop Archive on the campus of Western Michigan University. The Black History One on One Mobile Museum is currently scheduling in person and virtual exhibits nationwide. For more information, please contact Dr. Khalid Al Hakim directly at 313 645 4197, 313 645 4197 or visit their website at blackhistorymobilemuseum.com. That's blackhistorymobilemuseum.com. You can also email him at bhistory101 at yahoo.com, bhistory101 at yahoo.com. Yaya Rule is a line of African print-inspired apparel catered to the black community. The pieces include t-shirts, sweatshirts, hoodies, jackets, dresses, skirts, activewear, bags, and other accessories and home decor. This brand offers a revived way for men and women to wear their black pride and honor their African heritage anywhere at any time. This apparel line is for anyone, whether you are working in the corporate world, are an entrepreneur, or an artist. Their selection will allow you to casually let your pride shine or dress it up as wanted. It is for those who have already embraced African fabrics and for those who are just getting introduced to them. Reclaim and experience a part of our culture with rich and colorful African prints. The clothing line and the accessories are available right now starting at $17.99. For more information on the new items and accessories, visit yayarule.com. Are you getting ready for fall or winter? We have the solution for all seasonal clothing needs. Cometicwear.com is the go-to online source for Cometic African fashion and lifestyle products with a contemporary twist. We're committed to offering unique styles reflecting our African heritage. Cometicwear.com is inspired by Cometicscribes.com to influence our people in learning and showing pride. Please visit our website at Cometicwear.com. Have you tasted the world famous No Frowny Brownie yet from Pink Bakery? If not, what are you waiting for? They are vegan, gluten-free, and free of the big eight allergens. While eating their no frowny brownies, the fabulous Miss Tabitha Brown said they were very good. Very good. And you know, if she says that, they are. The Pink Bakery is the first black owned big eight allergen free baking mix company. Go to thepinkbakery.com. That's the pinkbakery.com to order their no frowny brownie mix today. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Sunday, February 14th, 2021. Oh, man, this Sunday goes by quickly. Um, and then I want to let you know uh, a couple things. One, we're here six days a week. I don't know what I was thinking when I agreed to do that, but we're here six days a week. Right? <laughs> we're here Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. to 12 midnight Eastern Standard Time. Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. to 12 midnight Eastern Standard Time. 
And then we're here Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I've been doing Sundays. Uh, April of 2021 will be my fifth year doing the African History Network show here on 9, 10 a.m. the Superstation WFDF. Usually I'm in the, the uh, radio station studio on Sunday nights, but because of COVID, they have us broadcasting from home, which is cool with me because I have a home studio. It's fine with me. Um, but we're here Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. to 12 midnight Eastern Standard Time. And then you can watch us on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotel. Download the iHeartRadio app. You can listen to the radio station live through iHeartRadio or on your radio dial, 9, 10 a.m., your radio dial, WFDF in Detroit. And we have uh, the audio podcast of these shows podcasted on iHeartRadio as well. Search for the African History Network show on uh, iHeartRadio, the African History Network show on, on iHeartRadio. And we're on nine different audio podcast platforms, iTunes, CastBox, Stitcher, FM player, tune in. Just search for the African History Network show. Somebody asked a question during the break. How you doing, Pierre? He says, I love your page. Thanks, Eric. Uh, William said, yeah, you're trying to get uh, that big bag, brother. <laughs> no, I, ain't try- I, don't, I don't know what that means. No, but <laughs> I'm, I'm busy working, man. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, somebody asked during the break, uh, is it too late to register for the class? No, it's not too late to register for the class. Um, and we posted the link. You can register at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Tuesday, February 16th, and I'm going to go to that clip uh, from Sister Nubia, Nubian Women of Antiquity, uh, Jalen, so cue that up. Tuesday, February 16th is class number two, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can still register. As soon as you register, you can watch class number one. We had a good class one. We ended up doing two and a half hours. All these sessions are archived. We do it live. You can watch live from around the world. You can ask questions during class through the live chat. All the sessions are archived, okay? All this stuff is archived. I'm creating a whole African History Network library. And uh, we have bonus content that you can watch also in the class. And then, so Tuesday, February 16th, our guest is going to be uh, cult- cultural anthropologist, Sister Nubia Wartford, who, you, who you've seen on, on our show a number of times throughout the years. Tuesday, February 23rd, class number three, our guest is going to be Dr. David M. Hotel author of the book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. And he'll talk about his new book, The First Americans Were Africans Revisited. And he'll talk about all this history and new research as well. He's going to be our, our guest uh, guest speaker in the class. We'll have a, one or two other guest speakers. OK, so you can um, still register. Don't worry about it. You still register right now. And um, it's going to blow you. This information will blow you away. I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have uh, video clips, book references. You don't have to buy any of the books to follow along in the class. Book references. It's about 50 articles that I reference. And one of the things I do, especially when we deal with the history of the Moors, I take news stories that you'll see in the media and connect that directly to history and correct that, connect that to the history of the Moors. Okay. So you can still register. All right. Um, speaking of Sister Nubia, I want to go to this clip. I, I had her on a show. Uh, we were in the studio. March 17, 2019. We talked about Nubian women of antiquity, the Queendom of Kush. And this is some of what she's going to talk about uh, on our show. Uh, uh, This is some of what she's going to talk about in the class on uh, Tuesday. Let's go to this clip, Jalen. People may be smoking and listening to the show, but that ain't what we're talking about. So go ahead. What is this about? Nubian women of antiquity, the Queendom of Kush. Thank you for having me again on your show, um, Brother uh, M. Hotep. Um, the Queendom of Kush is a 350-year period from 170 BCE to 314 CE, in which the, the queen ruled, or reigning queens were ruling Kush. Kush is, we're not sure if the pronunciation of Kush was Ka, Kesh, Kish, but it is written in the text. We're not sure what the, what the people call themselves. The ancient name for the for the for the area was Padma Hesse. Right. So you know we are not sure if the people call it the Kush themselves, but it is it is written in the text right. of the uh, Meroitic text, the text of the Egyptians. You know the Egyptians, uh, you know uh, via the Greeks and the Romans changed names and things. So that that was a little uh, you know speculation is there, but. Um, Kush, we're not talking about the Kush that we wrong. We're talking about the kingdom, the queendom of Kush at this point, where these sisters ruled. Right. Now, explain to people. Now, we'll see the name Tanahesi, but also Tasen. 
Yes. Okay, so Todd said he referred to the southern portion. So, right, uh, land, of the land of the boat. Land of the boat, the southern portion, which was the su which was the southern portion, and then Tana Hesse was the larger portion, which we which we call Kush, which went from mm -hmm. that border even a little a little east, a little west, a little more north. It was a large area, and and sometimes Tana Hesse would overtook Egypt because they had a long. They were like cousins that had fights all the time. Right. So, you know, sometimes it encompassed that entire empire. The Kushite Empire, we even speculate that that empire went over, um, past into Asia, Asia Minor, which is now called the Middle East, into Asia. We do know that the Shang Dynasty was a, was a, was an African dynasty mm -hmm. um, in Asia. Right. So in China. In China. China. Right. And then we also, we know that there were pyramids in Sarajevo and, 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 and Bosnia. That were our straight forward pyramids. Now there's trees and grass growing over them. So the Kushite Empire and the Egyptian Empire was much more huge. We even know that there's a Kush mountain range, and they also talk about in India, in the seven gates of Kush in Turkey. So the Kushite uh, influence in their reign and their empire probably is huge. Even Going down, uh, we know that the architecture and many structures that are as far as uh, Botswana mm -hmm. resemble the same, and that mm -hmm. that uh, structure dates back to 300,000 years BC. So we are a lot more ancient than than is told, as we've discussed before. The reason why the 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 use of of the European civilization, which they uh, which they trace their ancestry only to 60,000 years, where they start standing up straight. Well, there was never a time that we know in history the Africans did not stand up straight. <laughs> okay, so let me back up because you gave us a mouthful. Yeah. Okay. okay. And, and now, do you have your lectures on DVD or digital download? I do not. I do not. not oh, come on, Nubia. Come on. You uh, have to do that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Pause it right there, Jay. <laughs> Pause it right there. <laughs> All right, so that's uh, Sister Nubia. Um, we're going to try to see if we can get her on a, a Monday show. I reached out to her today, but I know she was busy, didn't hear back from her. But I interviewed her March 17th, 2019, on the African History Network show. She was um, going to do it. She was doing a lecture at uh, Wayne County Community College. It was coming up, and uh, we discussed Nubian women of antiquity, the queendom of kush nubian women of antiquity the queendom of kush that is um that video is on our, our youtube channel michael m hotel i m h o t e p and um we'll post the link here on the thread of the broadcast uh for that full interview okay but she's going to be our guest speaker in our class for tuesday february 16th 8 p.m eastern standard time so you can still register for the class. All right, let's get back to the um, history of Valentine's Day quickly. Then we're going to talk some about the origins of African American History Month and Dave Chappelle's story. We'll have to, I talked about Dave Chappelle Friday. We'll, we'll talk about that uh, on Monday show. I don't think we're going to have time to talk about uh, Dave Chappelle uh, today. Okay, so uh, I, I want to talk about briefly the, the Festival of Lupercalia, the Festival of Lupercalia, which is one of the foundational, which is one of the uh, foundations of Valentine's Day. Now, the uh, it was a Roman festival, festival of Lupercalia. It's also known as the Roman Wolf Festival, Lupercalia. Um, so celebrated at the Ides of March, which is the fifteenth. Celebrated at the Ides of March or February fifteenth, Lupercalia was a fertility uh, festival dedicated to the. Uh, Roman deity or Roman god Phanus, F A N U S, F sorry, Faunus, F A U F A U N U S, Faunus, F A U N U S. Okay, and um, Faunus was the Roman deity or Roman god of agriculture. And you're going to see once again when you deal with these festivals, like you deal with Easter, Istra, Oystra, Ishtar. Look up the derivation of the word Easter. All this is connected. And, you, you, and you're going to see these ancient uh, festivals from different cultures, whether they're Roman, from different European cultures. You're going to see them forming the foundation of these celebrations we celebrate today. Many people celebrate today. Okay. 
This is why um, the book by Dr. Dr. Ishaka Musa Barashango is so important. And he has a book one and book two. This is book one. Book two is around here somewhere where one of these stacks of books. Uh, African people and European holidays and mental genocide. African people and European holidays and mental genocide. Okay. Once again, I'm not telling you don't celebrate any of these. I'm not telling you don't celebrate Valentine's Day. Don't spend time with the one you love, of course. Um, and we'll talk some about a coma day briefly. And we'll talk about a coma day uh, on Monday, which is an African centered uh, black love uh, seven day celebration. Okay. So Lupercalia was a, a fertility festival dedicated to Faunus, the Roman deity of agriculture, as well as to the Roman founders, Romulus and Remus. And in the mythology, the mythology of Romulus and Remus, these were two uh, orphaned uh, boys and they suckled on the um, nipples of a she-wolf uh, called Lupa. Okay. And it, it's, it's a, um, it's a deep history there too. Okay. <laughs> uh, I don't have time to get deep into it, but uh, the she-wolf Lupa is it's, it's, it's in their mythology. And if you look up uh, LUPA, you look up Lupa, Romulus, and Remus, right? And uh, we'll just try to pull up something quickly here for you. Uh, it's on Wikipedia, of course. Uh, you can find information at history.com as well. Just to, um, well, I want to show you that picture. But just look at Romulus and Remus and you'll read about Lupa. Okay. Now, some people may ask, well, Lupa sounds similar to lupus, the autoimmune disease, lupus. Okay. And there's a correlation. If we look up uh, the word lupus at uh, Merriam-Webster Dictionary and go into the etymology of the word, uh, let's look at this here. So it's extremely important to study the etymology of words, okay, the word origins. Because you can learn a lot about history studying the origins of words. Christmas, going back to Christus Mass, and the word Christmas doesn't come into existence until mid 11th century AD. Um, Easter, Easter, Oystra, Oystra, Ishtar, um, Lupus, all, all of this is ties into history. Okay. So if we look at very quickly here, Miriam Webster. Lupus, definition of lupus, any of the, the any of several diseases characterized by skin lesions. Then if we look at um, uh, I want the etymology. First known 14th century medieval. Okay. History and etymology of the word lupus. Middle English from medieval from medieval Latin, from Latin meaning wolf. From Latin meaning wolf and lupus ties into lupa, L-U-P-A, who was the she-wolf who suckled Romulus and Remus, who were said to be the two boys that founded the uh, founded the uh, Rome. OK, so all this ties in the history and mythology and things like that. All right. All this is connected. So check this out as well. Merriam-Webster.com. I like, to, I like to be able to show you what it is I'm talking about. Proper documentation ends all conversation. You don't have to believe a word that I say. Go research this yourself. I'll give you the sources. Go research this yourself. But you want to study the etymology of words, word, word origins. And there's an online uh, etymological dictionary that I use, but I can't remember the name of it right now. So we'll talk we'll, maybe Monday show. We'll show you that as well. OK. All right. Let's keep it moving. Somebody said I'm moving fast. Yeah, because this is a two hour show. We're on live radio. This is, this is live radio. This ain't Facebook. This is live radio. We're broadcasting on Facebook. People are listening right now in Detroit on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF. I only have two hours. Okay, so let's continue. Um, so, to begin, so, so to begin the festival, 
of Lupercalia, the Roman festival of Lupercalia, members of the Luperci, L-U-P-E-R-C-I, the Luperci, an order of Roman priests, would gather at a sacred cave where the infants, Romulus and Remus, the founders of Rome, were to believe to have been cared for by the she-wolf, Lupa. Okay? Um, let me try to pull this article up quickly. I want you to see this here. Is that history.com? And, and what's interesting is um, some people say, oh, all well, oh, this history is hidden. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> you just don't know, you just don't know what you're looking at. <laughs> all this is all this history is not necessarily hidden. Some of it may be. Others, it's just staring you right in your face. You just don't know what you're looking at. Okay. Uh, let's see. Is this the right one here that I want? Yeah, this is it right here. And I, I, I read all these articles uh, uh, every day from uh, history.com and they just laying this stuff out. And you go and look into the word origins and all this stuff. All this stuff is connected. You know, now sometimes they may misrepresent ancient Egyptians and things like that. But they'll still tell you, uh, they'll still tell you uh, the truth. You just got to, you may have to wade through some stuff to get to it. But they still tell you the truth, okay? All right, let's see here. Let's go to right here. This is what I want. I want you, I want you to see this here. Okay. So to begin with, the members of the Luperci, an order of Roman priests, would gather at a sacred cave where the infants Romulus and Remus, the founders of Rome, were, this is according to the mythology, the founders of Rome, were believed to have been cared for by a she-wolf or lupa. Okay. Now the priest would sacrifice a goat for fertility and a dog for purification. So you're dealing with animal sacrifice, right? Now they now when 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 animal sacrifice may be part of other ancient cultures, whether you're dealing with Native American cultures, whether you're dealing with uh, the Olmecs or Aztecs or African cultures is frowned upon. They put it right here. This is European because they just put it right here. They would then strip the goat's hide into strips, dip them into the sacrificial blood and take to the streets, gently slapping both women and crop fields with the goat hide. Now, I'm not sure if they slapped them on the behind. I don't know if that's where that came from. <laughs> Let me stop. Okay. But anyway, <laughs> this is all right here in their history. They just put it all right out here. Okay. They ain't had nothing. Okay. They just put it right out here. Okay. All right. <laughs> so, um, anyway, uh, they would then strip the goat hide into, the, into strips, dip them into the sacrificial blood, and take to the streets, gently slapping both women and crop fields with the goat hide. Far from being fearful, far from being fearful, Roman women welcomed the touch of the hides, the goat hides, because it was believed to make them more fertile in the coming year. Later in the day, according to legend, all the young women in the city would place their names in a big urn. The city's bachelors would each choose a name and become paired for the year with his chosen woman. These matches often ended in marriage. Now, I don't know if this is where they got the idea of the TV show The Bachelor from, you know, but maybe, I don't know, who knows? Okay, I don't know, but hey, <laughs> it could be, all right? Okay, so so read the rest of this. This ties into the, the festival of Saturnalia. I mean, not festival Saturnalia, that's another Roman festival, Lupercalia. This ties into the Roman festival Lupercalia, which is a part of the origin of Valentine's Day, all right? I'm not telling you don't celebrate Valentine's Day, but you may not want to slap a woman on the hand. It ain't yours. But anyway. <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay. It, read the article that I wrote also. Um, um, it's at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Uh why do African Americans celebrate Valentine's Day? Why do African Americans celebrate Valentine's Day? Do we really know what we're celebrating? Okay, uh, so check that out. Also, okay, uh, is that, <laughs> I was about to 
I was about to go in another direction, but <laughs> maybe <laughs> maybe I shouldn't say that. But anyway, uh, <laughs> all right. So check that out. All right. Uh, let's switch gears here. Let's go to uh, where we're going to go to next. We're going to go to uh, African American History Month. Okay. We do it. Uh, uh, oh, Acoma Day. Let's talk about Acoma Day very quickly here. So there's an article from uh, AmsterdamNews.com. Uh, Manwasha Acoma Day is an international alternative to Valentine's Day. Acoma Day is an international alternative to Valentine's Day. We're going to try to get them on the show. Uh, they did a broadcast today. We shared it on our uh, Facebook fan page, the African History Network, also. And uh, we're going to pull up this article from the Amsterdam News uh, right here. Uh, this is from February 11th, 2021, and a beautiful couple. And a coma, a coma day is an international uh, alternative to Valentine's Day, an international alternative to Valentine's Day. It is a cultural holiday designed to uh, celebrate black love and black culture in its multiplicity. Uh, Mancho says, Mancho says, when asked what is the meaning behind a coma day, quote, the focus of a coma day is the intimate relationship and how that relationship creates family, neighborhood, community, and nationhood. The, the focus of a coma day is the intimate relationship and how that relationship creates family, uh, creates a uh, family, neighborhood, community, and nationhood, okay? So we'll bring this up here. Okay, that's dealing with a coma day. So the cultural holiday is a seven day holiday, much like Kwanzaa, where there are seven virtues and principles to follow, and they are building stones of what this holiday is all about, okay? So read this article here from New York Amsterdam News. We're about to go to the clip from uh, Malcolm X, uh, Jalen. Um, read this article from uh, New York Amsterdam News. A coma day is an international alternative to Valentine's Day. All right, here's Malcolm X asking the question of who are you? Who are you? Let's go to this clip, Jalen. If you can't do for yourself what the white man is doing for himself, don't say you're equal with the white man. If you can't set up a factory like he set up, Actually, don't talk that old equality talk. Who are you? You don't know. Don't tell me Negro. That's nothing. What were you before the white man named you a Negro? And where were you? And what did you have? What was yours? What language did you speak then? What was your name? It couldn't have been Smith or Jones or Bunch or Powell. That wasn't your name. They don't have those kind of names where you and I came from. No, what was your name? And why don't you now know what your name was then? Where did it go? Where did you lose it? Who took it? And how did he take it? What tongue did you speak? How did the man take your tongue? Where is your history? How did the man wipe out your history? How did the man, what did the man do to make you as dumb as you are right now? All right. So that's our brother Malcolm asking. Some very, uh, very, very important question. Who are you? What happened to you? What happened to your history? What happened to your language? What happened to your culture? What method was used to make us as dumb as we are right now? now but so he's, he didn't mean to, I don't think he meant to necessarily call people dumb as you're stupid, but ignorant of history, ignorant of our culture. Okay. So Let's talk some about the history of African American History Month. We'll go back to the phone lines in just a minute. And uh, uh, once again, because uh, somebody asked the uh, question, yes, you can still register for my online course, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Okay, as soon, soon as you register, you can watch class number one. Class number two will be uh, February 16th, 2023. Uh, 2021, February 16th, uh, 2021, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We do the classes live and then we they're all recorded. You can go back and watch them over and over again. You can watch them around the world. Uh, so that's fine. Okay. 
So I wrote an article a few years ago dealing with the history of African American History Month. And it's at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. And one of the reasons why I wrote it is because each year people just say some of the most ignorant, disrespectful things about Black History Month, African American History Month. Okay. Why we got to have the shortest month of the year, why we need a Black History Month, uh, why we have to have the coldest month of the year, all this stuff. Okay. You, 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 hear, the, you hear the type of nonsense that um, a lot of people say each year. And usually when they say those things, they don't talk about Dr. Carter G. Woodson and the Association for the Study of African-American Life and History. OK, he just gets totally left out of the conversation, which probably explains why they say things like that. All right. So I, I want to pull this up here. This is from a. Um, each year when I, I, I speak, uh, speak on African-American History Month, I deal with what the annual theme is. OK. And I deal with some uh, history of Dr. Carter G. Woodson. So we're going to go to this here. And February 7th, 1926, uh, Dr. Woodson uh, introduced uh, Negro History Week, okay, which is the second week in February. So I want to pull up this slide here. This deals with uh, some background information on uh, Black History Month which was renamed after African American History Month um, a, few, a few years ago. So let's look at this here. So Dr. Woodson uh, founded, Dr. Woodson founded Negro History Week in 1926. He explained the reason behind uh, the celebration in a pamphlet, quote, quote unquote, widely distributed months before the first celebration uh, was to take place during the second week in February, during the second week in February. Um, so this is taking place also during the uh, Great Migration, at the beginning of the Great Migration, which is uh, 1915 and 1970. So he chose the second week in February because it contained the birth dates of Frederick Douglass, which is Frederick Douglass' assumed birth date of February 14th and Abraham Lincoln's birth date of April 12th. I mean, sorry, February, February 12th and February 14th. February 14th for Frederick Douglass, Frederick Douglass assumed birth date, and February 12th, which was Abraham Lincoln's birth date. Frederick Douglass, born a slave, did not know the actual date of his birth, and he did not know the actual year. He knew it was either 1817 or 1818. He talks about this in his first autobiography. He wrote three autobiographies, by the way, Frederick Douglass. Um, April 12th, I was thinking of when the Civil War started, 1861. It is, um, February 12th is Abraham Lincoln's birthday. So he exclaimed that blacks knew, quote, practically nothing, end quote, about their history. This is Dr. Carter G. Woodson. He exclaimed that blacks knew practically nothing about their history. He ultimately believed that African Americans could benefit immensely from knowledge of their past and accomplishments of their ancestors, from knowledge of their past and accomplishments of their ancestors. He added that race prejudice, the racism, discrimination that we suffer from, race prejudice was the byproduct of whites' beliefs that African Americans had not contributed anything to world culture, okay? That African Americans had not contributed anything to world civilization. Right. So and, and when you study Dr. Woodson, Dr. Woodson believed that the history of African-Americans needed to be taught in every school across the country, not just schools where our children attended, but every school across the country. And this this ties into the efforts that we see taking place in states like uh, Arkansas. And uh, I, I talked about this on the show uh, uh, early in the week, Arkansas, there's five states, Arkansas, and I think uh, Mississippi, to limit what teachers are teaching about um, slavery and racial oppression, uh, different things like this. They want to limit that. 
and they want to push the 1776 project, which is a debunked um, version of American history. And that was the uh, commission that Donald Trump put together. Joe Biden disbanded it and took down that 1776 project off of the White, off of WhiteHouse.gov, which is good. But this ties into trying to rewrite history. This ties in trying to rewrite history and distort uh, the history of slavery. If you look at the article from USA Today, Republican state lawmakers want to punish schools that teach the 1619 Project. Republican state lawmakers want to punish schools that teach the 1619 Project. Republican lawmakers in uh, Arkansas, Iowa, Mississippi, Missouri, and South Dakota filed bills last month in January of 2021 that if enacted would cut funding to K through 12 schools and colleges that provide lessons derived from the award-winning project, the 1619 Project, even though there are some flaws in the 1619 Project. The South Dakota bill has since been withdrawn, okay? Read that article, that's from February 10th, 2021. We talked about it last week on my show. Uh, February 10th, 2021, Republican state lawmakers want to punish schools that teach the 1619 Project. That's from USA Today. Okay, uh, very quickly, we only have a couple of minutes left here. Um, so Dr. Woodson argued that if the historical record was set straight and that if the history of black people if the history of black people were studied along with the achievements of others in schools, not only would black youth uh, develop a sense of pride and self-worth, not only would black youth develop a sense of pride and self-worth, but racism would be abolished. Dr. Carter G. Woodson concluded, quote, let truth destroy the dividing prejudice of nationality and teach universal love without distinction of race, merit, or rank. With sublime enthusiasm and heavenly vision of the great teacher, let us help men rise above the race hate of their age unto, unto the altruism of a rejuvenated universe. Okay. All right. So we're out of, uh, those watching on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The, Af the African History Network, and our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep. Keep watching. We're going to keep broadcasting for a little while longer. We're out of time here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation WFDF will be back Monday. Uh, visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can register for our online course. Also, we have our 15 DVD bundle pack, the uh, Michael M. Hotel Black History Month DVD bundle pack. This is 15 of my lectures, including one dealing with, I go deep into the history and origins of African, African American History Month. That's at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. All right, right now it's correct, wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. Stay tuned for uh, who is it? Pastor Greg Davis or the best of Reverend Al Sharpton, one of them. We'll talk to you Monday night. Peace. All right. All right, everybody, keep watching. Okay, stand by. All right, we're out of time on 9, 10 a.m. WFDF. We're still here on our social media platforms. We'll keep going for a little while longer. We'll post a link here. You can register for the online course. Tuesday's classes are going to be really good with Sister Nubia. Um, and then uh, we'll post a link here, uh, the 15 DVD bundle pack. We have those shipping out this week also. Uh, the Michael M. Hotel uh, Black History Month DVD bundle pack. That's at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Uh, that's on sale $100. It's uh, 15 DVD lectures. We have that on digital download also. I think, I think we have that on digital download as well. All right, let's continue uh, dealing with this history about Dr. Carter G. Woodson. I've been wanting to do this earlier in the week, but haven't had, uh, it's been so much covering an impeachment trial and everything. It's been so much, haven't had a chance to um, deal with it. There was an article from uh, Zen Education Project, Zen Education Project, February 7th, 1926. Dr. Carter G. Woodson launched Negro History Week. OK, so check that out from um, Zen Education Project. Uh, also, they have a lot of good articles there as well. We'll post this link here. So it gives a, a brief history of. Um, the first African American History Month. Uh, yeah, Dr. Woodson was a member of Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated. Yeah, I mean, that's not a problem. I'm probably giving them a shout out. I'm a member of Phi Beta Sigma. That's that's fine. Dr. Woodson was, I've talked about that before. He's a member of Omega Psi Phi. 
Uh, okay. Let's continue. So this is a picture of Dr. Woods. Now, I, I've seen very few pictures of Dr. Carter G. Woodson actually smiling. I've seen a couple like a half smile. I've seen very few where he's actually smiling. But, you know, he's trying to educate the people who don't want to be educated. He's trying to teach the pe people about their history. Many of them don't want to learn their history. They run away from it. So, I, I, you know, I feel your pain. Now, Negro History Week was the first major achievement in popularizing black history and was unique in that it focused on the black youth. It focused on African-American youth, okay? Now, contrary to popular belief, it was never supposed to be the only time of the year we study our history, okay? It was unique that it focused on African-American youth. Dr. Woodson realized that the miseducation of African-Americans began in their homes, communities, and elementary schools. Their homes, communities, and elementary schools. Dr. Woodson's vision of Negro History Week was optimistic, strategic, long and long term. He wanted this modest week long celebration to serve as a stepping stone toward gradual introduction of black history into the curricula of all levels of the U.S. educational system, of all levels of the U.S. educational system. And he created uh, he founded the Associated Publishers, Inc., in uh, 1921, which is a publishing company, African-American-owned publishing company. We were publishing textbooks for schools and HBCUs, publishing his books as well, like The Miseducation of the Negro in 1933. Uh, so this was this was a bad brother here, Dr. Carter G. Woodson. He's, uh, to me, he's very much underrated as well. Now, if we look at this article here from uh, the Zen Education Project, I think that's the last slide here. Oh, okay. Let me continue. Um, so Dr. Woodson hoped that Negro History Week would evolve into Negro History Year. As, as he affirmed from time to time. As he affirmed from time to time. Dr. Woodson consistently instructed those observing the week that they needed to diligently Prepare for the celebration months in advance. I can't stress this enough because I, I know people mean well and have good hearts and, and Jesus, God, whatever God they believe in, loves them and loves the little children in the programs. And all. I understand that. But oftentimes when I speak at African-American History Month celebrations, I ask people who are organizing it. And especially a lot of churches. And, you know, it's good that the churches do this. But I ask them, uh, did you talk about this year's annual theme for African American History Month? And they look at me like I'm crazy. Like, did you talk about Dr. Carl G. Woodson, Association for the Study of African American Life and History, Negro Life and History, and the Origins of Black History Month? And they don't know what I'm talking about. So, um, as Professor Kaba Hiawatha Kamene teaches us, one of my teachers, to understand the existence of something, you must first understand the pre-existence of existence. To understand the existence of something, you must first understand the pre-existence of existence. To understand African American History Month and how powerful it could be, we have to understand his origins in Dr. Carter G. Woodson and the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. Because as I say year after year, we don't have to keep recycling the same 15 to 20 sanitized Negroes every year for these Black History Month celebrations. The other problem is, I mean, those the, the Frederick Douglass and Dr. King and Rosa Parks, and them, we need to study them because the way they're presented is oftentimes presented in a way to make white people feel comfortable with the oppression of African-Americans. And we can't do that. We have to deal with the revolutionary Dr. King, the Dr. King that tried to get a concealed pistol license in 1956 after his house was firebombed because his house was firebombed twice in 1956, once in January, the end of, toward the end of January. And then in September, I think it was September 56, his house was firebombed twice. This was, this was surrounding the um, Montgomery bus boycott. You know, we need to deal with, when we talk about African-American history, Month, we need to deal with stuff like this. 
this book from Professor Charles E. Cobb Jr. This nonviolent stuff that gets you killed. How guns made the civil rights movement possible. That's the real history of the civil rights movement. It was Negroes with guns protecting the nonviolent civil rights protesters and workers. They were protecting them from the Klan and the bigots and the white supremacists, things like this. This is this is even before the Deacons for Defense and Justice. They weren't founded in 1964 in Jonesboro, Louisiana. This is even before the Deacons for Defense and Justice. So when we, so when we deal with this history, we can't try to tell history that makes white people feel comfortable with the oppression of African Americans. It doesn't mean that we try to tell a history to try to offend anybody. We're dealing with our history. We're dealing with a chronology of what happened to us, but also not just domestic terrorism, but the but the the ingenuity, the accomplishments of African people. And African American History Month is not just supposed to look from 1619 up to the present. It's also supposed to study the accomplishments and achievements of African people on the continent of Africa and throughout the diaspora as well, to connect all of that together. So let's go back to this here. So Dr. Woodson hoped that uh, Negro History Week would evolve into Negro History Year. As he affirmed from time to time, Dr. Woodson consistently instructed those observing the week that they needed to diligently prepare for the celebration months, months in advance, and that after mid-February, they needed to continuing, they needed to continue acknowledging the role of African descendants in world history. So he's saying you can't just be super black for one week. I mean, you go back to being a Negro the rest of the year. This is a celebration of our history and our culture. But that doesn't mean you just go back to being ashamed the rest of the year and you don't deal with this. So, quote, Negro History Week should be a demonstration of what has been done in the study of the Negro during the year and at the same time as a demonstration of greater things to be accomplished. Dr. Carter G. Woodson instructed school teachers. He's telling them this is Negro History Week should be a demonstration of what has been done in the study of the Negro during the year. Dr. Woodson said a subject which receives attention one week out of the 36 will not mean much to anyone. So today, many people have it ass backwards. They think that the month of February is the month that we celebrate, that we study our history, and then we don't study our history until the next February. No. To understand the existence of something, you must first understand the pre-existence of existence. To understand African American History Month, you have to understand Dr. Carter G. Woodson and why it was created in the first place. Because if we understood this, a lot of these celebrations of African American History Month that we see would be much better. They would have more purpose, a better understanding of the history. They would understand what the annual theme is each year. The annual theme gives purpose and direction. So read the uh, read the book by uh, Dr. Payroll Dagbovi. Dagbovi is a history professor at Michigan State University. He wrote this excellent book on Dr. Carter G. Woodson called, Dr., uh, called Carter G. Woodson in Washington, D.C., The Father of Black History. Because Dr. Carter G. Woodson is known as the father of black history. OK. So read Dak Bowie's book. I've read it. It's a fantastic book. Uh, check out pages 100 to 102. Also wrote a. Article that's at our um, website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Uh, dealing with the history of African American History Month. I printed it out. I don't know where it is. I got to find it. I printed it out. We were supposed to talk about it uh, early in the week and ran out of time. 
Now, this right here, and uh, let's let's remove the caption here. This is Dr. Leonard Jeffries, one of my teachers. And when Dr. Jeffries and Professor James Small teach, another one of my teachers, they talk about the pyramid principle. You've heard my interviews with them throughout the years. And I show this, I learned this from them. So I show this in my presentations and we, we show, we deal with this in the online class as well. Um, this is a pyramid of Khafre at Giza in Egypt, in Africa, for those that don't know that Egypt is in Africa. And a pyramid has three sides. The three sides of the pyramid, the foundation is African history and culture. And this gives us our values, our interests, and our principles, our VIPs, as Dr. Leonard Jeffries and Professor James Small call it. Our VIPs, our values, our interests, and our principles. And the foundation, African history and culture, influences the two sides of the pyramid. They call it economics and politics. I, I, I reframed it and called it economic empowerment and political empowerment. Because the, your knowledge of your history and culture influences your economic empowerment and how you engage in economic empowerment. And it influences your political empowerment and your understanding of politics. Politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, pond resources, and the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties, their adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. When we go back to Sarah Rector, we go back to the Black Freedmen Indian Treaties of 1866. Article 6 of the U.S. Constitution tells you that the U.S. Constitution all of the previous treaties and all, this, all of the subsequent treaties are the supreme law of the land. Politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources, and the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties, their adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. But Dr. Leonard Jeffries and Professor, Professor Jane Small and also Professor Kaba Hiawatha Kamene, what they're teaching us is that you have to have a synthesis of all three. You can't just read metal nether and don't understand economics and don't understand politics. You can't just play djembe and don't understand economics and don't understand politics. When you study the great African civilizations that we love to talk about, whether it's ancient Kemet, whether it's, it's Nubia, ta Hesse, whether it's Abyssinia, Ethiopia, whether it's great Zimbabwe, whether it's Ghana, Sangha, Mali, you, you pick it. Pick whichever one you want. You're going to see that they have their history and culture intact for the most part. You're going to see that they have some type, they're engaging in some type of commerce, some type of trade. They have some type of African marketplace. They usually have some type of uh, medium of exchange, whether it was gold, whether it was salt. OK, whether it's coins, you, you, you go and look at Carthage. They had coins in Carthage. OK, they have some type of medium of exchange. They have some, there's some type of economy. OK, there's uh, they have agriculture, but you have some type of uh, trading, bartering of goods, services, uh, some type of African marketplace. They're also many times doing commerce trade with other nations or other groups of people, what have you. So you have some type of economy taking place. There's economics. Then you have some type of political structure. It wasn't just everybody do what they want to do in general. It's some type of political structure. Whether it's a Oba, whether it's a, a Nasubiti, a Pharaoh, there's some type of political structure. Okay? There as well. You're dealing with politics. You're dealing with laws. You're dealing with some type of policies being put in place. Whether you, whether you have a council of elders, whether you, it's something. It ain't just everybody just do what they want to do. So we have we have a synthesis. We have to have a synthesis of all three of these African history and culture, which gives us our values, our interests and our principles, our VIPs. This, this gives us a cultural paradigm that we see reality through. This tells us how to engage in economic empowerment. Do we take white business principles and dress them up as red, black and green and present that to African-Americans and call that black empowerment? Or do we operate based upon African concepts 
of economics, the cooperatives that Dr. Jessica Gordon Nemhard talks about in the book, Collective Courage, because what a lot of people are doing is taking white business principles and dress them up as red, black, and green and present, and present that as economic empowerment. But that's when you study our history, that's not how we were able to survive. The, the cooperatives means a group of people, the, the, co the, co um, the cooperatives is dealing with cooperative economics and the cooperatives had the uh, numerous owners of the cooperatives, of uh, the Colored Merchants Association that's created by 1928, coming from uh, the Negro Business League, founded about 1900 by uh, Booker T. Washington. The Colored Merchants uh, Union is founded uh, 1886 in Texas, okay? A well-known type of cooperative is a credit union where the members are also owners, okay? They get more benefits than just somebody that has a bank account. The cooperatives is an African concept, okay? But you have to understand history. To understand the existence of something, you must understand the pre-existence of existence. You have to understand how we did this in the past because the people's history and culture teaches them how to deal with the problems of the past in the present and the future to meet the needs of the, of the community. So you have to understand what is to understand what is. So uh, this is the book I was looking for earlier, African People and World History by Dr. Uh, John Henry Clark. African People and World History by Dr. John Henry Clark. Read pages 14 and 15. They talk about the Afri. We're talking about Africa after the rise and decline of the Greek civilization and the Roman destruction of the city of Carthage, the Romans organized the conquered territories into a province they called Africa, a word derived from Afri, A-F-R-I, Afri, the name of a group of people about whom little is known. This was a new name because previously all dark-skinned people were called Ethiopians. Since the Greeks referred to Africa as Ethiopia in in Ethiopia comes from Ethiops, which is a Greek term, which is a Greek word. Um, um, Abyssinia was the pre was one of the previous names. Uh, since the Greeks referred to Africa as Ethiopia, the land of the burnt face people. OK, so read this uh, more here. But this is a good book. It's only about 85, 86 pages, 92 with the bibliography from Dr. Uh, John Henrik Clark. African people and world history. Okay, that's the book I was looking for earlier. And collective courage is around here. Where the hell is collective courage? Uh, okay, we got this. I showed you this. This nonviolent stuff that gets you killed by Professor Charles E. Cobb Jr. Now, collective courage by Jessica Gordon Nimhart. Now, this is the book on the Deacons for Defense and Justice. Probably the best one. Uh, from Lance Hill, the, the Deacons for Defense, Armed Resistance, and the Civil Rights Movement. That's the uh, dealing with the history of the Deacons for Defense and Justice. This is uh, book number two by Dr. Shaka Musa Barashango, African People and European Holidays and Mental Genocide, book number two. Okay. And he deals with the origins of all these European holidays. He has a timeline of history in these books as well. This is Dr. King's last book. Got, Dr. King did write books. And when I go to Dr. King Day celebrations, and I try not to, really, I don't, because I don't want to be pissed off. Um, unless I know who's doing it, and I know that, you know, they, they know what they're talking about. A lot of these Dr. King Day celebrations, I could tell. People mean well, and, you know, God loves them and everything, and God knows their heart, but I could tell. Um, they never, like, read any books Dr. King wrote. I, could, I don't think they've read any papers Dr. King wrote. I'm not even sure they listened to a full speech besides I have a dream. And that wasn't even the original name of the speech. And the speech wasn't about a dream. I, you know, I know they mean well, but I'll be, uh, where do we go from here? Chaos or community? Uh, this is Dr. King's last book that he wrote. He wrote it in um, late 1967. Okay. Now, I was looking for this book right here. Incidentally, when I was on Roland Martin Unfiltered a couple weeks ago, well, maybe about three weeks ago, we spoke with Nate Parker, Nate Parker's new movie, American Skin. American Skin, he was talking about his movie. I got a chance to ask him a question. 
when I talked to when I asked him the question, I referenced his movie, The Birth of a Nation, about Nat Turner. And I referenced the book that he put out. This book here, a lot of people don't know this is the companion to the movie The Birth of a Nation from Nate Parker. This is the book Nate Parker put out, The Birth of a Nation, Nat Turner and the Making of a Movement, the official movie tie-in, edited by Nate Parker. A lot of people don't know this book exists. To understand the movie, you really need to read this book. And there's a there's a history chapter. So they have a lot of behind the scenes information, interviews with the cast, talking about the making of the movie, things like this. But there's a there's a chapter in here that'll blow you away. It's by two African American female historians, uh, Dr. Uh, Dana Ramey Berry and Dr. Erica Armstrong Dunbar. Now, Dr. Erica Armstrong Dunbar, I'm about to make this a four hour video. This ain't about to be four hours. Dr. Erica Armstrong Dunbar has a book out called uh about own a judge own a judge was a uh african-american female runaway slave from george washington's plantation uh mount vernon okay and she was a slave of uh uh really uh she was a, a, a personal attendant to george washington's wife martha okay and she's gonna run away uh, the name of the book is called never caught never caught about own a judge because uh, uh, owner judge ran away and she was never caught. Uh, this chapter here uh, starts on page 35, the unbroken chain of enslaved African resistance and rebellion by uh, Dr. K Dr. Erica Armstrong Dunbar and Dr. Dana, Dana uh, Ramey Berry. Okay, so they have, these sisters did their thing in here in this chapter here. So this gives a lot of historical background information on uh, Nat Turner. But check this out as well. Okay, now, this is what I was really looking for. I had to dig through the other books. Collective Courage by Dr. Jessica Gordon Nemhart, which deals with the history of cooperatives and cooperative economics, which is an African principle. Collective Courage by Dr. Jessica Gordon Nemhart, a history of African-American cooperative economic thought and practice. All right, and I interviewed this sister back in, I think it was like 2014. That interview's archived also. If you go Google her name and my name, it'll come up. This book right here. So that ties into back into African history and culture, giving us our VIPs, our values, our interests, and our principles. It gives us the cultural paradigm that we see reality, reality through. Power is the ability to define and shape reality and have other people accept your definition of reality as if it were their own. It's not the way Nobles teaches us. So the foundation ties into how we engage in economic empowerment. Do we just use white business principles and um, don't build like African institutions? Do we uh, think that uh, do and also you have to understand the difference between wealth creation and economic empowerment. Wealth creation is important, but black people invest in green dollars and in white owned corporations buying stocks. That's not economic empowerment. You can create wealth. We can all have stock portfolios valued at five million dollars. And we could still be spending 97% of our dollars with people that don't look like us. You have wealth creation, but you don't have economic empowerment. We need both. I'm all for wealth creation. We need both. That wealth has to be transformed into buying land, owning businesses, owning the radio stations, TV stations, grocery stores, gas stations in our communities, financing the politics, controlling the politics in our community, etc. Wealth creation and economic empowerment are not the same thing. Some people confuse the two. They're two entirely different things. We could all have stock portfolios valued at $5 million invested in white corporations, owning stock in white corporations, and still spend 97% of our dollars with Arabs and Chaldeans and Asians, everything they talk about at all these conferences we go to every year. They talk about in all the documentaries. We could still be doing everything wrong and still have wealth. Those are two entirely different things. I'm all for wealth creation, but that wealth has to be transformed into economic empowerment, buying up the land, the houses, the, the grocery stores, all that stuff in our communities, the, the dry cleaners, the gas stations, radio stations, franchises, that's ownership. So we have to understand the difference between wealth creation and economic empowerment. Both are needed, but we can't confuse one for the other. We can't confuse one for the other. Okay, that's enough of that. Um, 
let's see here. Okay, read this article here from um, Zen Education Project. Zen Education Project. This is about Dr. Carter G. Woodson. And it's written by my friend, uh, Dr. Daryl Scott, history professor at Howard University. And um, we're Facebook friends and we, we comment, uh, you know, I comment on his posts. Uh, on February 7th, 1926, Dr. Carter G. Woodson launched Negro History Week. February 7th, 1926, Dr. Carter G. Woodson launched Negro History Week. So you can read this, there's a lot to get into, but Dr. Daryl uh, Michael Scott, um, so he's a brilliant historian. He and I, we argue back and forth sometimes, but he has some, he has some good information. And he, he was one of the people who really turned me on to some information, some, some things I have figured out, but I was trying to like really nail it down. You hear people, and I want to keep this short, but you hear people say the 13th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution created mass incarceration or contributed to mass incarceration, some nonsense like that. But that's not true. So they talk about how it says uh, involuntary servitude is prohibited unless punishment for a crime. But the 13th Amendment is based upon the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. This is what a lot of people don't know. The 13th Amendment is based upon the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. And what's, what's taking place is after slavery ends, after uh, the Civil War and yet yeah, the 13th Amendment being passed and adopted and ratified in December of 1865, the rights that white men have are being given to the former African slaves. You're going to see the Civil Rights Act of 1866. 14th Amendment of 1868. That law um, of dealing with uh, involuntary servitude being prohibited unless duly convicted of a crime or what have you, that already applied to white men. Goes back to the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. Look that up. That already applied to white men. So they're giving the same rights, all that, to African Americans. You're going to have the 15th Amendment of 1870, which guarantees the right to vote for African-American men, not women, but African-American men. Um, because, you know, the documentary 13th by Ava DuVernay, I like Ava DuVernay, but the documentary is, is like really historically flawed because I saw the documentary twice. And it was around the time I, I, was, I was doing research on a lecture dealing with the history of uh, the war on drugs and looking at Richard Nixon's war on drugs that he declared, he declared June 17th, 1971. So people were saying, oh, the 13th Amendment created mass incarceration, things like this. But when you go back to 1970, there's only about 300,000 people in, in prison in the U.S. That's federal and state. It's only about 300,000 people. You have relatively low levels of incarceration. Is going to start increasing in the early 1970s because of Richard Nixon's war on drugs. And if you read the April 2016 uh, cover story for Harper's Bazaar Weekly magazine, is written by a journalist named Dan Baum, B-A-U-M, because I dealt with this in, in my lecture, dealing with the history of Richard Nixon's war on drugs, how it was a war in the African American community. And Dan Baum interviewed John Ehrlichman. John Ehrlichman was Richard Nixon's domestic policy advisor. John Ehrlichman did, uh, he got caught up in the Watergate scandal, went to prison, did about 18 months in the federal prison. Dan Baum interviewed him and, and John Ehrlichman told him that the war on drugs was a war on the African-American community and the uh, anti-Vietnam war effort. The, 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 the hippies and, you know, things like this protesting against the Vietnam War. And he said, and you can, all the news outlets reported on this, on this story, on this article. You can go research this. He said that we knew we could not criminal, we knew we could not make it illegal to be black. But by associating the black community with heroin 
and by associating associating the anti-war movement with marijuana. We could then raid their offices. We could then lock up their leaders, things like this. Go, go read that article. So in doing the research and going back and researching uh, the federal prison industries, 1934, Unicor, 1978 and, and, and looking at the looking at the going to um uh, uh bureau of um what was it bureau of justice bjs bjs.gov bureau of justice statistics looking at the prison populations going back decades this is relatively low incarceration yes african americans disproportionately made up people in prison before 1970s, but there's still relatively low prison populations, prison rates. We're going to see the explode in the 1970s. It wasn't because of the crime bill in 1994. That's some more dumbass nonsense people keep talking. The U.S. prison population quadruples from 1970 to 1993. The, go to go to BJS.gov, Bureau of Justice Statistics. The U.S. prison population quadruples from 1970 to 1993. So I was, uh, it was myself, historian Jamon Jordan, and Dr. Daryl Scott. We were, uh, Dr. Daryl Scott, a couple of years ago, spoke at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. Asala brought him here to speak, Association for the Study of African American Life and History. So we go to dinner afterwards. And it's Jamon, we've had Jamon here on the show. He's a brilliant historian. He does a lot of, um, he does uh, the Black Scroll Network uh, history tours, dealing with uh, historical sites in, in Detroit. So it's three of us having this historical conversation. And, and so I'm talking to him because Dr. Daryl Scott teaches a, a class at Howard University dealing with um, the, uh, it's called from mass incarceration, it's called from slavery to mass incarceration, from slavery to mass incarceration. And he talks about in his class how he has all these, what he calls 13thers coming into his class who see the, the, the documentary 13th, 13th and think that Mass incarceration because of the 13th Amendment, all this BS. And he said that when you look at South Carolina, South Carolina is where the Civil War starts, April 12, 1861. South Carolina is the first state to secede from the Union, December 20, 1861, which is going to lead to the Civil War. The Civil War starting April 14, 1861. April 12, 1861. This is uh, South Carolina secedes from the Union six weeks after Abraham Lincoln becomes president elect in early November 1860. South Carolina and other southern slaveholding states think that Lincoln's going to free the slaves. So he said in 1866, South Carolina got its first state prison, not county prison, but state prison, the first state prison in 1866. He said if the 13th Amendment was designed, if it was if they passed it and it's designed to re-enslave the former slaves and have mass incarceration. He said, how many beds do you think were, were in the first state prison that South Carolina had? He said it was 100. There's only 100 beds in the first state prison that South Carolina had. When you go and actually study the history, because I'm because because when I was doing my research on the lecture dealing with Richard Nixon's war on drugs. And I'm and I'm studying the whole war on drugs going back to the first anti-drug laws going back to 1875 in San Francisco, which were the anti-opium laws targeting uh, Chinese men working on the railroads. And white people were fearing what would these Chinese men do when they're high on opium or they're going to try to rape white women. And I'm dealing with, I'm looking at uh, why, why uh, cocaine was made illegal. And uh, I'm dealing with the uh, article from the New York Times from February 8th, 1914, exactly one year before the move to Birth of a Nation comes out, that deals with uh, 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 Negro cocaine fiends are now turning to sniffing since uh, whiskey is prohibited because of prohibition. And it's the fear uh, that uh, black men are going to rape white women when they're high on cocaine. And do uh, police officers now need to carry a 45 caliber handgun because a 38 is not powerful enough to kill a Negro high on cocaine? And I'm dealing with why marijuana was made illegal because of Harry J. Anslinger, uh, who was the first uh, chairman of the National Cottage Commission, and his testimony, well, his whole effort to make marijuana illegal because he said that 
uh, marijuana was used by jazz singers and Negroes and Filipinos and Mexicans and things like this. And his testimony in front of the U.S. Congress in 1937, where he talked about how white women crave black men sexually when they're high on marijuana. All this is, is very well documented. So I'm going through looking at this whole timeline of history. And I say, well, if Civil War ends in 1865 and you got this 13th Amendment 1865, why does it take 106 years for mass incarceration to start if this is why they passed the 13th Amendment? Why does it take 106 years? Because it don't have nothing to do with it. That's why. Because this, this, is, this is what Dr. Daryl Scott explained to me. People are just reading this text of the 13th Amendment and then just automatically assuming, oh, this is what created mass incarceration. No, because because that was that was why when I was doing this, doing the research for the lecture on the history of the war on drugs, th that was the question I kept coming up with. I'm studying federal prison industries. I'm looking at the prison population. I kept coming back to this. Why did it take 106 years for mass incarceration to start if the 13th Amendment was created to create mass incarceration. Because it wasn't. It's just more bad history like the fake Willie Lynch letter 1712 and, you know, Black John Hansen was president. It's just more nonsense. So, um, read this article here from uh, the Atlantic has the Atlantic.com has a uh, good article dealing with this article dealing with neuroscience. Um, and it deals with Harry J. Anslinger. There are other articles. Timeline.com has one dealing with Harry J. Anslinger, things like this. So this this is why you have to understand history. History teaches you how things happen, why things happen, and how to change it. T t history teaches you how did we get to this point, okay? What were the laws and policies put in place? How did we get to this point, all right? Let's look at this article here from theatlantic.com. Um, this is from June 2014, this article. Okay, wrong one. Let's flip back over. This is from June 2014. How neuroscience reinforces racist drug policy. Okay. And what I want to focus in, you can read the entire article. What I want to focus in on is Harry J. Anslinger, who was the first chairman of the National Narcotics Commission. So when you go study the history of drug laws in this country, basically what you're going to find is that as long as white people were using the drugs, it was all right. Problem occurs when African Americans, Mexicans, Asians, when they start using the drug, oh, now it's a problem. Oh, now we got to ban cocaine now we got to ban marijuana okay as long as white people using it using it they may call it something else cannabis or hemp okay and the term marijuana was a spanish term that was adopted specifically as a derogatory term which then ties into the anti-mexican sentiments that many americans had which goes back to the Mexican-American War of 1846 and 1848, which is really over a territory dispute because you had many uh, in the U.S., many Europeans who wanted to take over the entire North American continent. So the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo is what ended the uh, Mexican-American War. And in that treaty, the U.S. gets California, Arizona, Nevada, Colorado, Colorado, Utah, and New Mexico, all from Mexico. As it, that's the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. That's what ends the Mexican-American War. 
Then if you go to the 1930s, because we talk about 1937 with Harry J. Anslinger, in the 1930s, you had um, 1.8 million, up to 1.8 million Mexicans deported back to Mexico, starting with Herbert Hoover, who was president from basically 1929 to 33. And this is tying into the Great Depression because you had many white people in Herbert Hoover who said that the Mexicans were taking jobs away from Americans. This is during the Great Depression. So they deported about 1.8 million back to Mexico. 60% were here legally. 60% were here legally. This starts with Herbert Hoover and it continues with President Franklin Roosevelt. So let's look at this here because we're going to get out of here because I got to be back here uh, <laughs> 11 o'clock Monday night. <laughs> All right. So, uh, okay, let's look at this article here. Okay, neuroscience participates in a sophisticated form of revisionist history. It turns public discourse away from the fact that marijuana is not legal because it was discovered to cause brain damage. That's not, see, one of the biggest, when I hear people calling the radio shows and say marijuana should, it should be illegal, blah, blah, blah. 99% of the time or 95% of the time, they don't talk about why marijuana was made illegal because it used to be legal. 99% of the time, you, know, you got to understand the existence of something. You must first understand the pre-existence, pre-existence of existence. The question is not, should, where, should marijuana be made legal? That's not the question. The question we should ask is, why was it made illegal in the first place? Because as long as white people were using it, it was fine. There was no problem. So let's look at this. Neuroscience participates in a sophisticated form of revisionist history. It turns public discourse away from the fact that marijuana is not illegal because it was discovered to cause brain damage, but because of an early 20th century fear mongering campaign to associate it with Mexican immigrant workers. Wait a second. Then we have a white supremacist president that called Mexicans rapists and murderers and they bring disease and all type of stuff here. I'm trying to tell you, you have to understand U.S. relations to Mexico going back like 150 years or something like that, even maybe before that. Mexican Going back to the Mexican-American War, 1846 to 1848, but even going back before that and the Alamo and the dispute over Texas. And the fight between and the fight for the U.S. Well, uh, Texas getting this independence against Mexico, and then Texas becoming part of the uh, United States. You, you got to go back and study that whole history dealing with Mexico, because then you start understanding. Well, wait a second, hold on. This is why Trump is trying to demonize them. This is historical. This goes back to when they uh, deported 1.8 million. If we go to uh, history.com. And we're going to wrap this up here because hell, be, I'll be here for another two hours. Literally tell you the truth. Uh, <laughs> I'll be here for another two hours. So if we, because uh, I hear people talk all this. Um, white supremacy pits groups of oppressed people against each other to fight one another. So the 1% or 10% stays in power. And as I hear people, I hear African Americans talking about Mexicans and things like this. And I understand there's some Mexicans that have been taught to hate African Americans. But the question I would ask them is the same question that Malcolm X asked us Who taught you to hate yourself? Because you got some. Mexicans that have African ancestry. And we know that Mexico was conquered by Spain. So you, you have to understand that the 
image of African people has been distorted and that negative distorted image has been projected around the world by media, by Europeans, larger Europeans that control media. So if we look at this article here from history.com, official website of the History Channel, June 12, 2019, article by Becky Little, the U.S. deported a million of its own citizens to Mexico during the Great Depression. 1937, Harry J. Anslinger testifies in front of the U.S. Congress. That's during the Great Depression. Going back to the you know stock market crash, October 1929. Okay, in the 1930s, and oh, let me read to it. Okay, there were these were done. Okay, in the 1930s, the Los Angeles Welfare Department decided to start deporting hospital patients of Mexican descent. One of the patients was a woman with leprosy who was driven just over the border and left in Mexicali, Mexico. Others had tuberculosis, paralysis, mental illness, or problems related to old age, but that did not stop orderlies from carrying them out of medical institutions and sending them out of the country. These were the repatriation drives of a series of informal raids that took place around the United States during the Great Depression. Local governments and officials deported up to 1.8 million people to Mexico, according to research conducted by Joseph Dunn, a former uh, California state senator. Joseph Dunn estimates around 60% of these people were actually American citizens, many of them born in the U.S. to first-generation immigrants. For these citizens, deportation was not repat repatriation. It was exile from their country. It was exile from their own country because they were born here. Did not get Pay attention to this right here. The logic behind these raids, or lack thereof, was that Mexican immigrants were supposedly using resources and working jobs that should go to white Americans affected by the Great Depression. Where have we heard that before? These deportations happened not only in border states like California and Texas, but also in places like Michigan, Colorado, Illinois, Ohio, and New York. In 2003, a Detroit-born U.S. citizen named Jose Lopez testified before a California legislative committee about his family's 1931 deportation uh, to uh, uh, a state in western Mexico. Quote, he, he said, oh, okay, get this, I was five years old, okay, uh, so he, he was deported. But there are others that were not so fortunate. Uh, he and his surviving siblings managed to return to the U.S. in 1945. Okay, so so read so read this here. Okay, this gives a whole bunch of history and it ties into relations between Mexico and um, the U.S. All right, but this ties into the hatred that many in the U.S. many white people in the U.S. have for Mexicans. In Mexico. Okay, now they may go vacation down to Cancun. But this all deals with land territory disputes. Okay. And when you hear when you read about Manifest Destiny in 18 uh, 1845 in uh, John uh, John Sullivan, I think it was uh, Manifest Destiny. That you're dealing with the desire of Europeans, especially in the U.S., dealing with that, the, the desire of them to take over the entire North American continent. Well, that means you're going to have to take land away from uh, Mexico. That's part of North America. Manifest Destiny, 64. John L. O'Sullivan. John L. O'Sullivan, the editor of a magazine that served as an organ for the Democratic Party. And of partisan and of a partisan newspaper, because this is this is before the party realignment takes place and the Democratic Party 
they're they're not even 20 years old at this time. Democratic Party is founded in 1828. Uh, John L. O'Sullivan, the editor of a magazine that served as an organ for the Democratic Party and of a partisan newspaper, first wrote of Manifest Destiny in 1845, but at the time he did not think the words profound. Rather than being quote-unquote coined, the phrase was buried halfway through the third paragraph of a long essay in the July-August issue of the United States Magazine, and Democratic Review, the United States Magazine and Democratic Review, on the necessity of annexing Texas and the, inevi and the inevitability of American expansion. Is that with at the annexation of Texas? You have Europeans trying to take over the entire North American continent. John L. O'Sullivan was protesting European meddling in American affairs. So these Europeans here, they want to take over the entire North American continent. Just, the U.S., especially uh, so John L. O'Sullivan, O'Sullivan was protesting European meddling in American affairs, especially by France and England, which he said were acting, quote, for the avowed object of thwarting our policy and hampering our power, limiting our greatness and checking the fulfillment of our manifest destiny to overspread the continent allotted by providence for the free development of our yearly multiplying millions, end quote. John L. O'Sullivan's observation was a complaint rather than a call for aggression, and he referred to demography rather than pugnacity as the solution to the perceived problem of European interference. Democrats took up manifest destiny as a slogan. Now, at this time, Republican Party doesn't even exist. Republican Party wasn't founded until 1854 as a uh, direct result of the uh, Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854, which dealt with uh, leaving it up to people going into Western territories to determine whether, whether or not they wanted slavery as opposed to it being dictated to them by the federal government. That's the uh, 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 Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854, which will lead to the Republican Party being founded in 1854. OK, so at this point in time, 1845, Republican Party doesn't even exist. So. All right, that's enough. Uh, read this book here, uh, 10 minute guide to U.S. history, 10 minute guide to U.S. history from Britannica and Encyclopedia Britannica. It's page uh, 64 dealing with Manifest Destiny. You can look up Manifest Destiny also. OK, just look that up. Manifest Destiny. All right. So. Um. Uh, you have to understand this chronology of history, all right? And this is some of the this is this is some of the type of information we deal with in the online course. We probably won't talk about manifest destiny because it's 1845. Uh, we may we may get into that. I'm not sure. That's during slavery, but understand this chronology of history. Historical events don't happen in the vacuum; they are the culmination of a sequence of historical events that take place. So, to understand the existence of something, you must first understand the pre-existence of existence. Okay. So once again, um, you can register for the online course that I teach. It meets Tuesdays, uh, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we do the classes live. Uh, this is at my online school. We do the classes live. They're all archived. They're all recorded. You can go back and watch it over and over again. Watch from around the world. That's fine. Uh, next class, Tuesday, February 16, 2021. Our guest will be cult cultural anthropologist, Sister Nubia Watford. So as soon as you register, you can uh, start watching content. You can watch class number one. So the class is on sale, eighty dollars. Uh, let me let me get to this other article here, neuroscience. Okay, because see, all this stuff is tied together. So I would literally be here for the next two hours, and I can't do that because I have too much work to do, <laughs> and I got to be back here <laughs> eleven p.m. <laughs> tomorrow night. <laughs> all right, <laughs> so. This article here from the Atlantic, this is how we got to this. Marijuana is not illegal because it was discovered to cause brain damage, but because of an early 20th century fear mongering campaign to associate marijuana with Mexican immigrant workers. The campaign infamously led the first director of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics 
Harry J. Anslinger, A-N-S-L-I-N-G-R, Harry J. Anslinger, culminated in the Marijuana Tax Act of 1937, federal legislation that prohibitively taxed cannabis and hemp. Harry J. Anslinger had also become particularly adept at using public media to propagandize the evils of marijuana. His essay, Marijuana Assassin of Youth, was published in the American magazine that same year, 1937. This is during the Great Depression, while they're deporting Mexicans back to Mexico, saying you're taking jobs away from white people, and 60% of the people they're deporting were here legally. In the essay, Marijuana Assassin of Youth, Harry J. Anslinger offered panic-inducing musings like, quote, how many murders, suicides, robberies, criminal assaults, holdups, burglaries, and deeds of maniacal insanity it causes each year, especially among the young, can only be conjectured. No one knows when he places a marijuana cigarette to his lips whether he will become a joyous reveler in a musical heaven a mad insinate, a calm philosopher, or a murderer. So they're, they're using the media to spread fear about marijuana because of people who's using it, because you have more Mexicans coming into the country and they're changing the name. Instead of calling it cannabis or hemp, they take the Spanish term marijuana to associate it with what they're trying to outlaw and associate marijuana with that hatred that many white people in this country have for Mexicans. Sensationalism like this was a specific was specifically aimed at a white readership. Sensationalism like this was specifically aimed at a white readership that might worry about an un, uh, unfathomably dangerous, quote unquote, ethnic drug getting into the hands of his children. Harry J. Anslinger's congressional testimony. Now, this is extremely important here. Harry J. Anslinger's congressional testimony directly betrayed his racist motivations to enact federal legislation against marijuana. He said, quote, there are 100,000 total marijuana smokers in the U.S. and most are Negroes, Hispanics, Filipinos, and entertainers. Their satanic music, jazz, and swing, swing music, not swinging, that's something else. They may have been doing swinging, but that's something else. Their satanic music, jazz, and swing result from marijuana usage. This marijuana causes white women to seek sexual relations with Negroes, entertainers, and others. That's not me. That's what Harry J. Hanslinger testified in front of Congress. So when I hear people say, talk about whether marijuana should be made legal or not, the question I would ask is you have to understand the history of why it was made illegal. Because as long as white people were using it, it wasn't a problem. So read this article here from theatlantic.com um, How Neuroscience reinforces racist drug policy. This is one of the articles I, I, I read because I was doing all this research preparing for my lecture dealing with the history of the war on drugs. And I had already heard about Harry J. Anslinger and all this stuff, but I'm putting this whole timeline together. Then you start dealing, you start dealing with what the U.S. was doing to Mexican-Americans and shipping them back, sending them back to Mexico and all this stuff during the Great Depression, saying, oh, you're taking jobs away from white people, things like this. But they didn't talk about how because when you read the article from uh, history.com, what they say is, okay, you are not focused on how they are spending money, how Mexicans are spending money in the American economy, consumption, what they're buying, which contributes to your gross domestic product. You're, 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 you're trying to just Focus on them as people who are just taking, taking, taking. But you don't have a problem taking their money when they're buying products. 
When they're buying clothes and they're buying food and everything, everything else, contributing to your gross domestic product. This is it's a deep article. Okay. So uh, we'll talk some more about the history of African American History Month uh Monday, because I got a lot more and don't have uh <laughs> I got more information than I have time. Uh, so let me just show you this one. This lastly, we'll get out of here because I ain't plan to go on this long. Uh, if you visit a solid.org, official website of uh, Asala Association for the Study of African American Life and History, co founded by Dr. Carter G. Woodson, uh, they have information about this year's. Uh, annual theme for African American History Month. So we've talked about it before. You can read it. And um, if you have an African American History Month celebration coming up soon, please incorporate this. Please, for the love of Dr. Carter G. Woodson, if you respect this man, please incorporate this into his celebrations. It breaks my heart when I go to um, Black History Month celebrations and they don't even mention Dr. Carter G. Woodson. And don't mention the annual theme uh okay where are we right here 2000 2021 theme the black family representation identity and diversity this is at asala.org and you just click on uh they have annual themes here for african-american history month so they have a write-up they have a pdf you can download we'll talk about this on monday show the black family representation identity and diversity this is the official theme for African American History Month 2021. This doesn't mean it's the only thing that you can talk about, but this helps give purpose, direction. They have a lot of information here and some resources that you can use also. Okay, um, so whatever we didn't get to today, we'll do with Monday. I got a, a lot, and we'll talk some about uh, Trump being acquitted by 43 spineless, traitorous uh, Republicans. We'll talk some about that. Uh, register for uh, the online course that I teach, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. And um, as soon as you register, you can start watching content. And in, in, in our Tuesday, February 23rd class, I guess, will be Dr. David M. Hotel, who wrote the book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. Also, um, our 15 DVD bundle pack, the, um, the Michael M. Hotel Black History Month bundle pack. That's available right now as well. So a lot of people want interesting information, new information for African American History Month. So when you go to our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, uh, scroll down, you'll see the information for the radio show Monday through Friday and Sundays. You click right here to read articles by me, Michael M. Hotep. Information here about the online course. Click right here for register. Register here. Takes you to the next page. Click right here and roll. You can enroll. As soon as you enroll, you can start watching content. Um, but what was, show, what was I going to show you here? Scroll past the information for the show. We have a video here of, uh, I mean, scroll past the information for the class. We have a video here that gives you an overview of the class also. This uh, has my 15 DVD bundle pack right here. Okay. Click here to order. And it shows you the uh, what's in the bundle. These are all lectures I've done. Okay, so I'll sell $100. You get my um, presentation dealing with the film Black Panther. It's almost a three hour lecture I did dealing with the film Black Panther. Shows how the film Black Panther relates to African history, culture, African language, spiritual systems, things like that. This one right here, I did this in 2018. This deals with, uh, this is Breaking the Chains. Why we celebrate African American History Month is this with the history of African American History Month. This is a three hour presentation. Not do with dispelling myths about our history also. So I'm doing a visual PowerPoint presentation. This one, uh, Malcolm X, 50 years later, why is he still relevant? It was with Malcolm and also Malcolm's influence on uh, Afrocentric uh, hip hop, uh, uh, positive uh, hip hop. Uh, this one, Dr. King, the distortion of the legacy of Dr. Of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the revolutionary will not be televised on the television because on the television, they usually don't show you the revolutionary Dr. King. They show you the Dr. King they use to make white people feel comfortable with the oppression of African-Americans. 
Uh, this is another one I did with uh, dealing with the film Black Panther. Lessons from the film Black Panther, economic guerrilla warfare, political self-defense, and how to Wakanda the vote. How do we take the enthusiasm from the film Black Panther and use that for economic empowerment, political empowerment? You can buy any of these individually. A lot of these are on digital download, um, but we have them in the bundle pack. This deals with the Three-Fifths Compromise of 1787, Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3 of the U.S. Constitution, and why I did not say that we were three-fifths of a human being. That's a misunderstanding of, of, the, of the law and the text and all of that. I also deal with the origins and history of the Electoral College created by the U.S. Constitution as well. Uh, 13 forms of wealth and redistributing the pain, keys to economic empowerment and entrepreneurship. So this deals with entrepreneurship and economic empowerment and I tie all that into history also. Uh, then you get, uh, let's see, the light of ancient Egypt awakens the African mind to economic empowerment. Uh, this here deals with the real history of the Tuskegee experiment of untreated syphilis on the Negro male. And no, they did not inject them with syphilis. Uh, there were 600 men in the study, 399 had an early form of syphilis called latent syphilis, 201 did not have syphilis. They were the, they were the control group. Uh, they were denied treatment. I'm not saying it was good. I'm saying a lot of stuff circulating on social media about the Tuskegee experiment is false. They were denied treatment, but no, they were not injected uh, with syphilis. That's just more uh, urban myth like the Willie Lynch letter of 1712 and Willie Lynch never historically existed. Uh, so you get that. And then uh, great African women in history, the mothers of civilization. You get the uh, four hour version. It's a two DVD set. There were some great African women in our history from all different time periods. Uh, you get that. And then uh, which other, which one? also. Oh, now this one I did for children dealing with the film Black Panther. I was presenting to. 65th through 12th graders and their parents, 65th through 12th graders and their parents. Um, this is a Black Panther analysis for children, African culture, history, and Afrofuturism. Okay. And I'm showing them how the film uh, Black Panther relates to African history and culture, how they can use different elements here to teach history. Okay. Uh, so we have that one, and then what else we have? Uh, oh, this is a classic. African-American resistance in the era of Donald Trump, voter suppression, reparations, and how elections have consequences. So I deal with um, the rampant voter suppression that took place in the 2016 presidential election. I deal with similarities between Richard Nixon becoming president in 1968 and Donald Trump becoming president in, in 2016. Both were backlashes to periods of time of perceived advancement for African-Americans. Uh, so we deal with that in that presentation. And then uh, lastly, what was the last one? Oh, there's another classic. Ancient Kemet, the winter solstice and the history of Christmas. Ancient Kemet, the winter solstice and the history of Christmas. So I deal with the pre-Christian uh, celebrations, the pre-Christian uh, celebrations, the winter solstice fellow celebrations that form the foundation of Christmas and they deal with how all that evolved and we deal with Osar, Osset and Heru, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis and Horus and Heru being born of a virgin birth on December 25th to the virgin Osset and deal with all that as well. Okay, so that's in the 15 DVD bundle pack. Uh, we, both, we posted the link here. It's also on the homepage of our website, africanhistorynetwork.com. 